Rider, and we're back. It's your boy Young Dale, and we're here with the Down Under 40k podcast, Madawi's number one podcast, and I am Aries Way Elamore Vale's best 40k player. So it's just me for the intro today. Um, we'll just start with a little shout out to the major sponsors for our faction champs for the Down Under 40k circuit, Emperor. If you want to buy any uh, 40k stuff online, that's the website to go to. So they've got a little code for us. If you use the code capital D, capital U, 4040, and then small case, so DU40K, you can get $5 off your first purchase of $100 or more. And if you spend $100 or more, you get free shipping. So get around that. They support us. So uh, we like to support them. And even if you've already uh, used a little code, when there's that little section that you can leave a comment, tell them down under 40k sent you. So uh, get around that. Support them because they support us. So I guess the first big bit of news is um, this is either coming out, hopefully this will come out on Saturday, and Saturday 6pm our uh, major tickets go on sale to Patreon members. So if you want to get around that, get on the Patreon. So there you go, just a little tip jar. But um, we try and give our uh, supporters a bit of value and part of that is getting all tickets 24 hours early so they'll have the first opportunity. But the tickets for the major go on sale on Sunday at 6 p.m. So we're looking at a 100-person major um, out of Madawi Social. We're going to rent the club top to bottom so it's only going to be 40K players all weekend. We're going to be serving lunch both days. Hopefully... The plan is to be open for breakfast and open for dinner as well. So it's literally going to be a one-stop shop for 40K. So it's, it's just going to be absolute mayhem. Um, we've got a lot of plans that we want to get going for that. Um, it should be a lot of fun. So if you're keen for that, don't miss out. The tickets will move pretty fast. We're doing it. They ain't cheap. 160 a ticket, but that includes lunch both days, valued at 50 bucks. So the ticket's really only 110 bucks, and it's going to pump. It's six rounds, 100 players, lots of points. It's going to be mayhem. Um, just book that in. It's on the 1st and 2nd of April next year, and... Uh, um, and I, I, I promise if Ben Ben doesn't listen to these podcasts, but I promise I'm not going to get a. Oh, I've actually I made a promise that I'm not going to sleep in his house, so I'm I'm going to be in the swag. So you know how it is. We'll be getting on the beers. We'll be getting on the uh, the storm surges. So we're going to have some 40k themed cocktails. 40k shenanigans will be happening. Um, what else has been going on? We got a neoprene mats in. The pigeon has been working hard. He's got some more merch coming our way. He just got a bunch of down under 40k mats. I'm pretty sure there's maybe a few more left if someone wants to contact the page to buy, buy to try buy some, but it was mostly a pre-order situation. So if anyone ordered them, they should be heading out your way very soon. Um, but if you missed out and you want to get some, maybe drop us a comment on the page, message the page, um, because... We'll probably do a merch drop as well um, a little bit before the major and then we'll hand it all out. The major would be pretty cool. So that might be some cool shit. We might get some dice. We might get some mats. We might get some jumpers and singlets. It's all that kind of stuff. So if you want to get around that, let us know. Now, on today's podcast, we have Ben Yemen. Oh, I've already said it wrong. Yaman, Yaman, Yemen. My boy Ben. He is uh, <laughs> the head TO of battle in the bush and one of the friday night game boys out at orange he's come on for the world's longest 15 minute intro for battle in the bush i think we dribbled shit for 50 plus minutes so (laughs) if that's what you're into get around that um and then after that we get first place second place and our boy ben big cat way forever mr four and one uh he came on came in fifth with his tyranids they were all coming on the um, podcast. I think it's an hour and a half worth of a Tyranid Fest. So we got three Leviathan lists, but apparently all very different. So um, Ben gets in around the round table, and uh, I won't spoil it because the boys will come on and tell you how they went. But um, it's uh, all fun and games, so that should be some good fun. And then... We'll have the Khan wrap it up right at the end. So I'll leave you with that. So here comes me and Ben dribbling shit. And then we'll have a bit of a tyranny love fest right after. Hooroo.
G'day, and we're back here with uh, Head T.O. of Battle in the Bush um, from Friday Night Gaming fame, Ben Yeomans. I've said it wrong already, mate. Yeomans. <laughs> Nailed it straight out the gate. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. Hey, there you go, How mate. you doing, mate? Yeah, good, good. Good. Got the kids way to bed, had a little vape. You're, fucking, you're yeah. living your best life, mate. Ready to go. Yeah, Ready to just, go. just typical Tuesday night. Yeah. So we got you on. We, we kind of want to set the scene for um, anyone that doesn't know. Anyone in New South Wales should know, but if we got any uh, out-of-state listeners, um, Battle in the Bush just happened last weekend, so we thought mm. we'd get Ben on. We've also got a little bit later in the podcast, we got first placed, second place and fifth place, uh, all Tyranid players uh, coming on to chat all about how they went. But we thought we'd set the scene and uh, chat up what's going on, going on at, uh, at at Orange. So, Ben, why don't you introduce yourself um, and tell us a little bit about Friday Night Gaming and what you guys get up to. Yeah, thanks, mate. Um, yeah, so uh, it's Ben. We're from uh, Friday Night Gaming. It's a group based in Orange out in the Central West. Um, for those of you that don't know, it's about oh, probably about three hours inland from Sydney. Mm-hmm. Um, Great wine, I can tell you oh, that. Oh, mate. The wine's so, out of control. It is. It's just we're all pretty much raging alcoholics here, man. Um, and, yeah, so basically just a little uh, gaming group was started, little anyway, uh, a little gaming group that just started in, in my house pretty much. It was just four or five of us were, were gaming and it didn't take long before all the closet sort of garage gamers came out of the woodworks and next thing we knew we were sort of averaging 20, 30 players at uh, a regular monthly meet and um, got about 400-odd on our Facebook page uh, from around the Central West and even, you know, uh, on the coast, and Sydney, that sort of thing. Um, they've joined in and, and, yeah, we've sort of been running regular events. So I've been around for about 10 years and been running tournaments for about uh, eight of those. I was just looking back at the first Battle in the Bush just then to see when it was. It was, yeah, eight years ago. So I've uh, been doing it for a bit now and uh, it's just sort of been growing every year, which is awesome. Got to this year, we uh, had 80 tickets up for sale. Uh, sold out pretty much within a couple of days, so it's good to see everyone super keen still on 40k and, and the tawny scene. And uh, yeah, had a great weekend. Yeah, it's lovely. It, it is really nice when tickets move fast. That's, oh, yeah. uh, there's there's not not many a better feeling than a sellout feeling. Even when we do our little um, like 16 person RTTs, if, if it goes. Um, in like less than a day, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's good. Yeah. I know um, uh, our boy, Pobby Ben, he runs um, our Sydney RTTs and he prides himself that they sell out in about an hour. He froths yeah. on it and we <laughs> froth on it for him too, so it's good. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, you never quite know. Like, you know, one time you sell out. Uh, I think our last Bell and Bush sold out and it was about 20 hours. It was one day. and That was 60 tickets. Uh, this one a little bit longer. I think with, you know, COVID and everything, it's uh, slowed things down a bit, but yeah, still within within 48 hours, I think we'd sold the whole lady. So, still got some people frothing at the mouth for a bit of 40k action, which is good to see. No, it is really good. 40k is pumping, mate. Pumping. Um, <laughs> it is. So, so, eight years. Yeah, it's a bit of an mm. institution. It's been around as long as I remember, which isn't that far back, to be fair. But mm. um, I, I remember Hayden, um, he, Hayden Ford, who came in third, he commented um, on your one of your posts, I think it was today or yesterday, that he's been to the last five. Yeah. So, um, yeah, mate, he's part of the furniture now. He's a um, <laughs> honorary orange citizen. Yeah. He he won. Was it battle or was it – because you do battle, but don't you do another one as well? We do uh, a couple. Um, yeah. So Battle in the Bush is our big one. Uh, that's our sort of premier event each year. Um, we've also got No Respite, which is more around that 32-player uh, uh, GT level. Yeah. Um, and then we've got a couple of smaller – ones which have actually ended up growing a bit as well. We had uh, December, December to Dismember, which is our Christmas special. Uh, it's usually around 16, but it's sort of grown to the 32 mark as well. And then um, we sort of help out the local store with a couple of different tourneys through the years, just a few little RTTs, little, you know, eight and 16 player ones. Oh, lovely. Uh, so it's reckon- all happening. But, yeah, I think Caden won. Yeah, he won a battle in the bush. Either way, look, he's just up here kicking the shit out of everyone every time Tommy gets a chance. So uh, he's always welcome. 
Good Gaden. No, nah, he's good quality. I remember because he come, he took a big break off, and he come back. Um, it wasn't that long ago. It would have been only just over a year ago. Mm. And he and it, like I didn't really know him that well because I he left before I got back. And he was telling me, yeah, I was pretty good back in the day. I was like, all right, mate. And then he just, yeah, he's he's very good. <laughs> <laughs> he oh, he let you know all shit. about it. Yeah, yeah. No. I mean, you got to you got to you know you got to follow it up. No, he's good. He's a, he's a top bloke, and he's a big um, advocate for the community too. You know, he's always helping out with the. So I remember back when we used to run the, uh, we used to help run the Australian Championship for ITC when it was at CanCon. Um, he was, you know, he was always pitching in to help there. Uh, so he's been around old Hayden and the uh, Overwatch boys. Yeah, they're loving it. He's uh, he's got big plans for next year as well. I, I think he's always got big plans for anyone that knows him, but I think that they're going to happen uh, next year. So mm. be listening out. But um, enough about this isn't the Hayden podcast. What You, you kind of no, did it a little be. bit. <laughs> We've had him on before twice, I think. No, probably more than that, actually. <laughs> he had his own podcast when he won Battle, I'm pretty sure. But um, yeah, nice. Why don't you set the scene a little bit? Um, what's going on out there in the, in the 40K scene? You mentioned the store. So mm. you guys are running, like, multiple events. But what, if someone was to come in to to their first battle in the bush or even just rock up on a weekend and just notice that there's some 40K going on at the local store, what, what are they mm. expecting to see out there? Oh, mate, look, there's heaps. I don't know if it's just there's nothing else to do and it's bloody cold during winter, but... Um, I mean, there's a fair bit to do these days, like you said, particularly if you like wine, but uh, when traditionally not so much. It's always been really big in Orange and uh, Bathurst. I think a lot of people probably more likely to know Bathurst because of the race and everything, uh, but it's only 40 minutes away. It's kind of like our, our sister town. Um, and, yeah, wargaming for some reason has just always been huge, even since I was a little kid and it was a really obscure sort of hobby. It was always big in Orange. Um, so... Um, you know, we've got the club, the FNG club. Um, for years, we didn't really have a store so much. We sort of had a hobby shop that kind of sold a bit of Warhammer, but there was no tables. No, it wasn't like a gaming store. Um, so we sort of just kicked off our own thing, like I said before. And uh, and and nowadays, yeah, there is. There's this Games of More in Orange, which is a proper dedicated gaming store. Um, there's also a Game On in Bathurst, which is sort of equally sized. Uh, big gaming store and between those two ourselves from that gaming and brawl which is sort of a big club in bathurst um yeah we all sort of get together and and do quite a bit on the event scene i'd say um the scenes yeah it's just really friendly like it's good like it's more about the beers than anything else but in saying that um yeah it's about the beers and also kicking the hell out of each other so there's quite a strong competitive scene um uh, we've got a few players uh, from the local area that are up there. Uh, we had one on top table at Battle in the Bush, Colin Johnson. He's uh, one of the brawl boys from Bathurst. Um, he's on top table at, at Battle in the Bush. Um, and maybe the years, you know, we've had uh, players on podiums, the front and centre at all sorts of different events. So it does have a strong competitive scene, but, you know, sportsmanship, um, beers and just um, the hobby in general is probably more the focus. So... If you're ever in town, like you're ever in Orange, hit up Games and More. Um, Nick down at Games and More will put you in the right direction. Or, uh, yeah, we've got Friday Night Game page on, on Facebook. Uh, we meet once a month, and uh, those meets are definitely about the beers more than anything. Uh, but they're good fun. Well, that's it. It's, um, you, you can be competitive, but at the same time, it's – it's got to come community first when it's at that level because I know they're, uh, they're like the two big towns, but they're still just big towns, so everyone knows mm. everyone. So there's yeah. it's a huge social contract that goes along with playing 40K. Oh, for sure. Look, it's definitely a lot bigger than it used to be uh, when I was growing up. I think uh, Orange and Bathurst combined are sort of pushing 100,000 people mark now. I mean, nothing compared to Sydney and that, obviously, but, you know, that with Bathurst, um, Dubbo, which is only a couple of hours away, around 150,000 people. Um, so it is a fairly biggish pool of people. But like you said, you get a name. Everyone gets to know each other. And I guess, um, you know, you can be competitive, but at the end of the day, if you're going to – if you're going to be a bit toxic about it, it's not you're not going to last long, I guess, um, before people start not wanting to really play games with you. So there's kind of always just been this sort of natural 
progression to everyone just really being supportive of each other, um, looking out for each other and, and, you know, being good mates. Like I've made fantastic friends through the years, um, playing war game, like war gaming, 40 K age of Sigma, Warhammer, all the old classic ones. And, um, yeah, fantastic community out in the central West. It's good times. So you've got your fantastic community and then you go and invite the rest of the state and that's how we get to uh, battle in the bush. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well that's it. We got to, you know, we got to try and uh, we got to try and prove ourselves over the those sort of east of the mountains for sure. Yeah. So why don't you set the scene for us for what was uh, about to go down last weekend? So mm. uh, new venue, more tickets. What tell us a little mm. bit about w- what was happening. Yeah, so out of the like I talked about COVID earlier, but out of the Sort of uh, embers of COVID, people were starting their time for a few games again, I think. Um, so we decided to ramp it up this year. Um, traditionally, we've always sort of tried to keep the ticket prize, ticket like pulled down, um, ticket prices anyway, so that, you know, um, it was affordable for everyone to come and then put all of that into prize support. We were pretty lucky to have a super cheap venue. Um, we'd already had a, a pool of terrain that we'd built over years um so we were able to just take nearly all the ticket money and put it straight back into prizes uh so this year we decided we'll ramp up the ticket prices a little bit only a little bit um but then put that towards upgrading the venue um and then upgrading our terrain set so 40k is a bit of a changed game these days um some of the older terrain we had that's been floating around since um sixth and seventh edition just doesn't cut the mustard anymore so we um, upgraded that um, to be more in line with the modern game and uh, upgraded the venue so we could have 80 players. And, um, yeah, we're able to sort of comfortably fit them in, which is great, at the Orange Egg Services Club. Uh, turned out to be a terrific little venue. So, so yeah, 80 players. It's our, our biggest event. Um, we had 72 uh, in the tournament, so, yeah, about a 10% attrition rate over the weekend, which isn't too bad. And, um, yeah, fantastic weekend, mate. It was, it was pretty full on. Oh, that's good, eh? And like you said, um, we've got, got the rest of the state coming in, so that'd be a fair few Sydney boys. Mm, um, there was. I know, we, I know we took a few card lows from the Hunter. Did you? Oh, and mm. there's even some, um, uh, eight, was there ACT boys? Yeah, yep. Yeah, there's a couple of boys from ACT, a um, um, couple of boys from further out west. Uh, so, you know, Young, Parks, that sort of thing. Um, Dubbo, uh, Bathurst, of course, they love to come down and try and muscle it over us. A um, uh, bit of a rivalry there, friendly rivalry. And, of course, yeah, everyone from Sydney and, and across the coast. So um, all around the state, I think we actually even do we have an interstate. Well, that might have been last year. We usually get a couple interstate as well from from um, Victoria, that sort of thing. So... It's just awesome that people are so keen to travel for events. Um, you know, makes all, all the effort sort of worth it, for sure. That's it. Uh, uh, the Adelaide boys just did a post on their uh, state page about um, how much – one of the uh, – Adam Napier, the one of the boys from Uprising. Mm. Yeah, did no, big, Adam, yeah. Yeah, did a big post about how, how um, encouraging all the South Australia boys to get out, travel to other states and play 40K and just, just a big spiel about getting around it. So I uh, got stuck in there and uh, posted our own little event. Uh, mm. <laughs> saw that yeah. can't get, a, get away without a little plug <laughs> oh for sure mate no, I'm keen I've, um, I've, I've actually had a little bit of a break playing this year just with real life and adulting getting in the road but I uh, saw your event come up and I think I'm going to use it as a bit of a bit of a catalyst to get uh to get psyched up again for playing uh so i think i'll be uh jumping on board that one mate for sure that that's your time within the last i don't know three four months of uh ninth edition if that all goes to plan so it'll be a good little little hurrah but yeah that'll be good fun Mm. so um when the boys come into town rolling into town who were you looking out for as favorites at the tournament did you have the eye on some people so I knew Hayden would be wooden spoon, so I didn't bother looking at that dude <laughs> anymore. <laughs> no. uh, definitely, you know, like Hayden and Ben Way, uh, those boys, uh, I didn't really actually know Ben very well. I chatted to him a bit online, but I'd heard he's, he's a bit of a goer, so um, they were definitely out there. We had Josh McMillan, um, the ATC captain. He always comes. He's been coming for years as well. Um, 
he's been a bell in the bush stalwart for feels like six years actually he's there every time so it's, it's we, alleged he broke the uh he broke the the covid fence to make it out one year but I, then i was assured it was all above board he, but there was some controversy <laughs> at the time oh mate you should have seen him because we made it you know we put a big drill out about it was when it was all breaking out at in sydney and um no one knew anything so I said you know no one from the greater western area sydney sorry guys we'll refund your tickets um and then and then Josh rocks up. I'm like, bro, aren't you from Sydney? Like, what are you doing? He's like, no, no, I live like five minutes out of the <laughs> Great Western in Sydney. But he's like, no, he's good. Um, no, he's, he's a legend. So, but he was he was coming down. He came down this year, and you know, I knew he was always in contention for the top spot. Um, a couple of the other boys from um, uh, tennis. Shit. Totally forgot their team name. TNS. Um, uh, you know, Andrew Andrew, Andrew Sherman. Um, Michael Duke, those boys, I've, I've seen their names, um, you know, up in the top leagues before. We had actually a couple of local boys too um, that I reckon had a good shot. And like I said, one of them was on the top table, uh, Colin Johnson. He's a real gun from Brawl. And uh, Jeff Dunster, who's who's in our our team, actually my team, in, in Beard, um, he's, a, he's a bit of a goer. Uh, a couple of the other boys from Beard every now and again just pull something out of their ass, but generally, generally we've had too many beers to really compete at that level. <laughs> so I wasn't expecting too much from us, um, but you never know with those boys. So we do have some players that have gotten gone all right over the years. It was, it was um, a pretty pretty hot little list of players you you know. Mate, you, you obviously yeah. didn't know Benny way too well because if you knew him enough, you'd know he's he's forever Mister Four and One. He can't yeah. get over he can't get over that hump. <laughs> so I said to Colin, he's, he Colin is the same. He's always the bridesmaid. I couldn't tell you how many times he's played at top table and lost. Um, and he yeah followed suit this weekend. Uh, always the bridesmaid, never the bride. That's all right. Well, I got faith. The, the boys can. The boys will get it done one day. Oh, but, for um, sure. So, so we won't give away who won because uh, they're coming on mm. next. Um, but so with all the, well, I reckon we get into some. Uh, we went to the, um, pay, oh, not the Patreon, but yeah, get on our Patreon, boys. But we went on the Discord and uh, and asked some some of the boys if they had any questions for you. So we'll just go through a few of them, mm. and then I'll, I've got a few more I want to ask you, and then I reckon we'll wrap it up and move it on to the boys. Straight out but, the gate. Uh, sorry, sorry, boys, I'm not available. Um, <laughs> um, so we'll cut we'll cut half the questions out and just go with the other half. That's it. <laughs> um, we got Ben, twenty twenty one Sally's champion. So Ben Hader from the Wednesday Night Boys. Um, uh, uh, when we were there, um, the boys talked about how events keep growing and making a big deal um, out of the mediocre man award. Mm. Um, why? Why do you think the events continue to grow? Um, in the 40k scene and then could you also talk about how TOs can support um, players of all level with awards not just mm. the top placing players so I think he's asking what's what's going on that um, you guys just can up the, up the ticket um, amounts um, like uh, availabilities and it's still going to grow you're still going to sell out and um, how yeah. can you support the I guess which I think I love that as well um, mm. that it, if the top players come just to to get uh, boatloads of prize support, um, they don't really need it because they already got boatloads everywhere. Yeah, I know that yeah. Chris Wright, if he ever spent all the money he's got saved at Good Games Maitland, they'd go under for sure. I reckon. I reckon we need Chris needs to throw his own tawny and give all his prize support back. <laughs> That's it. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. <laughs> no, look, I think we've we talked about this recently actually because we don't really understand it either. To be honest, uh, <laughs> the first. I was talking about it a couple of times on the weekend and I you know, full of beers, it sort of comes out every now and again that I'm a bit bit proud really. Um, but our first battle in the bush was sixteen players. Um, it was just held down at a local council hall, like a community hall kind of thing. Uh, the terrain was dog shit. Um, we had prizes like um, it was back in the community comp days, I don't know if you were around then, but um, we had we had uh, prizes like um, I don't give a shit about community comp and basically people that you know stuff like that like fun prizes and it was a fantastic little event I remember it really well um, and the next time we ran it again 
Yeah, that, I think the growth was a bit slower those first couple of years. It was about 24 to 32 sort of players. Um, but we sort of just stuck with that theme of, of at first taking the piss out of prizes, like having fun prizes for, for um, you know, things like um, Wooden Spoon was uh, Dan Murphy's voucher, so, you know, Drown Your Sorrows voucher, kind of thing like that. Um, and just try to have fun, basically. As it got a bit more serious and as ITC came around, we were one of the first um, tournament scenes. If not, no, we weren't the first, but one of the first tournaments to adopt ITC in Australia. And um, it got a little bit more serious then. And um, so we went sort of more for some bigger prizes. Again, we, we had the luxury of a cheaper venue um, and and a pool of a community pool of terrain that we'd already sort of worked on so we we're able to just give a lot back to prize support whereas traditionally at the time the big tournaments like cancon and stuff a lot of that prize the ticket money went into the event rather than the prize pool so we're kind of unique in that we we're able to give away like um at one stage in the thousands of dollars cold out cash of prizes um and and i guess we just sort of consistently grew with that um you know, we consistently had good prizes, consistently at the time had a good terrain pool um, and just consistently, you know, tried to run a good event. So I guess consistency is probably, if I had to sum it up in one word, the key. Um, but, yeah, we sort of went back a bit this year. So we sort of slipped into, you know, giving really big prizes for the top tables, um, like almost to the point we were trying to make it not a – not a semi-professional thing, but you know, trying to set a bar of you can earn you can earn a fair bit of money in the tournament scene. We're, we're sort of going down that route for a while, but we, in the sake of COVID and everyone coming back in the scene, we sort of pulled the reins on that this year and uh, went back to just trying to um, disperse that prize pool amongst everyone. Like, there's a lot of people they're never going to be on the top tables, but they rock up year after year. They're absolute legends. Their armies are beautiful. They play a good game, but, you know, they're just never going to be at that top, top tier. But the tournament doesn't exist without them. Like, um, those top players are top of nothing if no one else is rocking up. So um, we decided, you know, we did all the best in faction prizes. I love Mediocre Man because that's where I am nearly all the time, <laughs> middle of the tables. Um, you know, we don't mind celebrating a bit of mediocrity. Um Renaissance Man's another good prize that I really like where it's sort of painting combined with scores, so best of both worlds, but, um, you yeah, know, not really the top of either, but doing pretty well. And we, we lean pretty heavily into hobby prizes you see it too. We had, some, we had a couple of categories for painting. I did um, notice that. I, yeah. I loved the – because you did um, Judges Award and Voted Award, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. That's so good. I, I yeah. think – we're going to steal that one because... Oh, go for it, man. I think it's awesome. Like, Because yeah. players, pa- players' choice is awesome because... Um, and it, what I was really stoked about this year, I think we just had a cool room of people, but this year I reckon we, we would have had 72 people there by the time the voting was happened. I reckon I had about 60 votes that I had to count through. So everyone really... Took, I, even I got a vote when I wasn't playing. But <laughs> apart from that, <laughs> some smart ass. But they um, took it seriously and they, and they thought it was worth their time. To exactly. The like people people that, you know, you traditionally used to people coming in just to, to kick ass and play games, a lot of people really put some time into going around, having a look at the models and enjoying and, and voting for that hobby side of it. Because some people, that's all they go for um, is to, you know, show off their army or share their army with other people they're not necessarily going there for the win and and i think the tournaments should be that they're the celebration of the hobby at a top level and that top level includes the hobby not just the game and that's the painting and, and modeling as well so so it's some really good prizes for for painting this year so um so yeah we had a couple of them and the judges won again it just gives us an opportunity to look at things like um you know theme of an army and like, the cool factor i guess uh it doesn't necessarily have to be the best painted um even though that's part of it it's it's also you know um the the, the love and passion that someone's put into mm-hmm. an army um and then of course we had some fantastic prizes for the podium as well so yeah so anyway that's that's basically what we do we just try and celebrate the hobby as in general and uh we try and do it consistently and i think that's why the event's growing year after year yeah yeah i think like you said the 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 main body of players like 
out of those 70 or 80 tickets that you sold, I think only maybe 15 of them um, thought they ever had a chance of winning it and probably about 10 of them were del- delusional anyways. So, uh, <laughs> I was going to say, there's more than 15, but most of them really don't. When they look deep <laughs> down inside themselves, they know. Well, you, you can, yeah. So, um, I no, think there's I'll, a lot to be said for enjoying the game at that level mm-hmm. without necessarily intending to win. I like going to tournaments. I like playing, you know, hard and fast, a, a dedicated game where you're not, you know, you're focusing on that game for three hours and maybe a couple of beers every now and again, but that's your focus for that time. And you're, you're trying to win, you know, there's a fun in the challenge of that. Um, but I never intend to go podium. Um, and I know I'm probably going to lose and that's fine if I do. And I think a lot of people are like that. They enjoy the hobby. They enjoy the competition, but they know they're just coming for the, for that, that, that's enough and I think we should celebrate that and that's what we tried to do that's de- I think that's definitely uh, one of the things um, you mentioned Ren Man so when we did our Ren Man um, for our GT ours was um, Battle Point Paint and Players Player all voted together yeah, and nice. um, and we actually they got um, a meek, uh, equal amount of prize supporters first place yeah, so sweet. that was one of the ways we're trying to and that'll be the same thing going forward I'd, like, I'd actually love to make it because like um, the one I always refer back to is Warzone Atlanta, which is in America. Mm-hmm. And yeah. It's a very popular one, and it, they go like it's full of competitive guys that know how to stomp dicks and shit. But mm. um, like they're always they, they don't push that the hardest. And I'd I'd really like we'll be pushing at our major this uh, coming around next year. But the the actual real winner is is the is going to be the Ren Man. So that'll be I like last. It. The, the last prize announced, um, they'll get equal prize to first place, and then just like you just got to up like those are the those are the guys that like if you can do all three facets of the hobby, like that you are You're the like, champion of the yeah, hobby, mate. You are definitely yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, look, I'm with you. We always um, with painting best painter, even when we didn't have you know. Ren Man and all that sort of stuff. Best Painter was always the equivalent of second place. We always we did always have the champion as the top prize, but Best Painter was always at minimum the equivalent of second place. Um, mm. So I reckon those hobby sort of prizes. And, and sports is another good one. Sports, are, we actually didn't do sports this year uh, only because – we did only have a certain – I mean, we gave away, I think, 40-something prizes. There's only so yeah. much we could give away. Um, but – and it's sometimes a bit hard to get people to actually do properly, but um, but yeah, if you can if you can make it work, sports is another amazing one. I think everyone um, everyone you know needs to take notes from the good sports guys. I mean, like you said, the dudes that win, the dudes that are there to kick butt, um, they're happy with their ITC score, and maybe you know a trophy just to say that they're the best. I that's think all, that, I think they want the really trophy need. more than than anything <laughs> yeah. to be honest. So I, yeah. that, that trophy, they froth yeah. on it, eh? Oh mate, we that's again, and that's the other thing we did. Like even this, the best in faction trophies. Like I love seeing them come back out in all the RTTs throughout the rest of the year. You got mm. dudes there smashing beers out of their Battle in the Bush best in faction trophy. Like they're proud of it, and that's, that's a good flex, and, eh? Oh, you fucking should be. I reckon that's a good. Um, yeah, that's an awesome thing to, to flex on. And so this year, our first, second, and third prizes were big gem and Stein things. So they I can. You notice them. You just um, you just keep coming up. I'm, I'm going to be stealing all this good dude, shit. Dude, go for that's it. That's so let's, good. Let's, that's <laughs> I reckon. Um, you know, promoting alcoholism as prizes. Oh, yeah. I'm all in. Yeah. Yeah, let's go, baby. <laughs> um, now. That was, so that was one question from Ben that we've managed yeah, sorry, to 15 minutes on. to answer. I'm, I'm really well, passionate on this one. <laughs> That's all right, mate. Hey, if we go long enough, we'll just release it at its own podcast. <laughs> and <laughs> while we're at it, because um, I'm always good for a plug, so Andrew Trowbridge, the Dice King, he got your um, – was it the fan voted? The, yeah, he got yes. fan voted, yep. So he is um, coming on the next podcast after this with, along with um, Jeff Carroll, and they are the two absolute monster hobbyists in the state. Mm-hmm. So either of um, – yeah, I think they they ran down their list of uh, achievements, and they've got pretty much every GT between them. Every GT they've gone to in the past, I don't know, two years. Mm. So they're coming on next podcast to chat all about the hobby. So if that's uh, down your boat, uh, down your alley, uh, float your boat. Um, make sure you listen out for that one. But 
Next, we got um, Alex the Greek. Um, what's your favourite and least favourite things about being a TO? Ooh, mm, I'm like a spicy that's one a here. That's a big one. No, yeah, I'll be honest. I'll be honest. Um, we'll start with my least favourite. We'll start with the negative, I guess. Uh, my least favourite is dealing with some of the toxicity. Um, over the look, it's a lot better than it was, and I got to say, this weekend gone past was probably the best I've ever experienced in terms of a lack of. Uh, toxicity uh, but there are players who will go for every advantage they can like shitty little annoying things that they'll, they'll be a prick to play against um, and they just piss everyone off they just a bad time for everyone that they play against I hate to say it but it's it's real um, and dealing with them as a TO um, is a real friggin headache um, so if you fall into that category and you know you do, please stop. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, like, and, and again, like I said, it's the extreme minority, like one or two people out of 80 might be like this, but they're always the one that takes so much effort, like as much effort, if not more, for the TO than the rest of the tournament does. Yep. Um, so, you know, be a sportsman, be a good Dale? Oh, sorry. Swearing. Be a good bloke. Um, you know, just just don't cause that sort of heartache. Win honestly. If you're winning because you're cheating or winning because you're doing shitty little things to get an advantage, you're not winning. You, yeah. So, so that's that's my take on the worst part of it. Um, but the best part is uh, just seeing everyone have fun, man. Like, I love the reason I into TOing and the reason that the other boys TO as well is they love this hobby. Um, they love playing with their man dollies, they love painting things, they love the gaming and they love the socialising. And to see all that come together and to know that you helped it ha- make it happen, that's the best part by far. Like seeing mates come from Sydney, seeing people you might only see a couple of times a year, having beers with them, throwing dice, like, there's, there's nothing better. So to be able to help do that, Definitely the best part. Lovely. Oh, I feel you there, brother. That's good shit. Um, and I think on the on the negative side, it's definitely from my perspective, the more the community grows and connects as like a, a region or a state or whatever, there's just more and more social contracts. So you can't like everyone knows everyone at this point. Mm. And like we're all in fa- like compared to how what how many Facebook chats were you in about forty k uh, like even seven years ago probably not that many probably now, all of them seven years yeah, ago yeah <laughs> all, all that existed <laughs> yeah but like like it's just like everyone yeah. knows everyone now we've all got like a it's big mainstream. to chat it's all it's all um you, no one no one slips through the cracks anymore so I think everyone understands that now. I, I gotta say I just think like I don't know if it's because there is more people in the hobby or. And it sort of dilutes those sort of people. But I was generally a little nervous. And I even said this in my speech at the end of the tournament. I was a little nervous going into this. I hadn't TO'd for uh, about a year and I hadn't actually even played 40K for about six months. Um, so I was a little nervous going into this that, you know, I'm going to run across these that exact type of player that I'm talking about. And um, I just didn't. I just didn't. This, there was a couple of tiny little incidents and they were dealt with like, by gentlemen, like gentlemen, everyone got along at the end, and um, it just reminded me how good this community is. Like, yeah, legends, everyone there. So, as 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 you said it perfectly, bunch of good Dale. Yep, <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> now, uh, what do we got here? We got um, he's got his name as Lyrus OS 5 so he's already been in trouble from. Uh, Big cat in the Discord because you're meant to have your real name. So he must be he might mm. be one of your boys that's just popped in. But uh hey, if he's taken the piss, that's definite. No, there are actually some good questions. Oh, okay. Um so what number one, what's your thoughts on the local FNG meta compared to the wider 40k community? So we kind of mm. touch we kind of touch on that a little bit, what what you're about. Mm. But um what what is the maybe what are some differences to the boys that you see traveling in? Um so I think Probably not a lot. Um, I think the main thing that there is at uh, FNG is, and and Brawl and the guys, is people will take their army and their passion first and then try to make it work competitively second. There's a lot less meta chasing, I guess. Um, There's players um, 
I myself, I'm one of them. I'll just play Death Guard. I don't care if they're absolutely dog shit like they were a little while back. Um, that's what I'm playing. That's what I love. That's what I play. I'll, I will try and make it work competitively. I'll try and play a tough game, but that's what I'm doing. And that's really common. Um, um, so you do see, you know, like this year there was, there was a lot of Necron players. Yeah, it's obvious Necrons are pretty good at the moment. Um, so I reckon at events you do see that meta shift as mm. armies are, are stronger and weaker, whereas at, at FNG events, particularly the ones where it's just local guys, um, same people are bringing the same armies every time. They might be yeah. tweaked lists and they're trying to make them work and they're trying to they're still trying to go for the win, but it's still those people that just love that army and that's what they play. So I think that's a big difference, yeah. Lovely. Uh, second question, do you uh, wish to get amongst it more often or are you preferred TOing? Get amongst it for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, I love TOing. It's a great time. Um, it, it's it's a lot of work. Um, so for those that um, haven't TOed before, thank your TO. It doesn't matter what size event I play. Buy him a fucking um, beer. You oh, know what? No one buys me enough beers. I, <laughs> mate, uh, I, if I see you at the D40K one, I'll make sure you're legless by the end of the day because I know oh, you're pain. You There's just you're... so many moving parts. It's not even like... It's not even the list checking or, or the game side, even, you know, organising venues, organising terrain, organising ticketing, organising pricing, organising insurance, organising like legality and stuff like that. Um, there's a lot that goes into TOing. Um, we do it because we love it, but when you've got that compared to rocking up, sinking some piss and rolling dice, pretty hard to say you prefer, <laughs> you know, you don't prefer gaming. Um, so, yeah, I definitely prefer gaming there. Lovely. And then the last one from uh, Boy. Uh, what sort of feedback have you received um, from the players from this past event? Um, anything you're looking to improve on or have you achieved the pinnacle of 40K tournament experience? <laughs> Never a pinnacle. There's no such thing. Um, mate, feedback was super positive. Um, you know, you, um, it was really good to hear that people were having fun. That was the one that I heard. They said I had a lot of fun. It was a good piece of feedback I heard a few times. So that's that's probably the most important thing. The the big piece piece for us this year though was the terrain uplift. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, we we had our our old terrain pool used to be brilliant, but it's been aging and it wasn't really fit for the game anymore. And our last battle in the bush, we had a fair bit of drama around that, and some of the players were not happy. It caused a bit of issue. Um, so we we really doubled down, put a lot of money and effort into uplifting that, and then also had Hayden and and Benny Way help us there, uh, and that was commented on to have people actually thank us and say that they really enjoyed the terrain. Um, was yeah, it was it was um, I guess justification. It felt good that we that the effort was was worth it, and people enjoyed the game more because of it. Um, so yeah, but but that's probably the next thing that I would probably want to keep improving on. Um, yeah, you know, we we it's always nice to have good functional terrain, but if you can have good functional and good looking and nice to play on terrain, that's the next level above again. And so we've got a bit more work to go there. There's some painting to do and um, a bit to expand on there. So that's probably the, what we look on to improve next time. Um, and air conditioning for the venue. Sorry, everyone, that the aircon wasn't working. I don't know what was going on. I couldn't tell you how many times I told them at the bar. I think they were getting sick of hearing from me. Um, there was obviously something going on with the aircon that weekend. But if we can keep that nice and nice and frosty and um, the terrain up to scratch, then, yeah, I reckon the next one will be even better again. Lovely. Well, that's it from the listeners. Now, that kind of leads on to my questions. Sure. What... Oh, the first one is we'll, we'll keep going from there. I saw, uh, so I uh, was at home. Just uh, as everyone knows, I don't actually play forty k. I uh, just <laughs> just post about it on Facebook a lot. So I've I watched every live video you put up and that we did. Thanks, and um, that venue, fucking mm. massive. Mm. And we already know you can sell the tickets. Are we going to a hundred players next year? That's the plan, mate. Uh, yes, that's the plan. So. That venue actually expands again. Um, Bullshit. Yeah, no, nah, it's good. Uh, and this is – costs us a fucking heap. So <laughs> like we're talking about about ticket prices. They might be relatively high again. We'll see how we go. I've got a little um, story about that before, before you get your too worried about 
anyone gets too worried about that. But um, the Adelaide boys, so they sold their uprising. They did two twenty tickets in less than a day, mm. and they were surprised by that. But then they put a post up, um, and they're like, "Look, we've we look we found another venue. We can do three hundred next year, mm. but ticket tickets are going to go up." Um, I think they did 115 this year, and they said, mm. "Look, it's going to be closer to the 150, 160," yeah. and 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 overwhelmingly positive response mm. was just "fuck, get it done." We we back is like that's so good. The, like they 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 should know that we back them already just by moving yeah. that many tickets that fast, like mm. crazy. So like and. Uh, uh, only overwhelming positive responses. So I wouldn't, yeah, you just do what you got to do. That's I awesome. Mean, the people yeah, will look, come. Yeah, and uh, so good to see the community behind uh, events. I really hope to get out to Adelaide one day. Uh, it's a fair trek for us in the in the Central West, that far from an airport. Um, but we, we do have a group of dudes going this year and hopefully we can get more and more. But, um, but yeah, look, that's the big thing. The bigger the venue, the more terrain, the more overheads, the, you know, cost money. So, um, yeah, if everyone's happy to support it, I think in the end, everyone wants to see those big events. Like mm-hmm. everyone wants to have four or 500 plus player majors on the calendar, you know, within driving distance of their house. Everyone wants that. Um, and then to have 300 players, is just, yeah, that's mental. Those guys are insane. Um, so, so yeah, we can expand that venue again. Um, we do still need to keep working on terrain, so we've got a bit more fundraising to do during the year, um, which we'll do through other events and stuff. So, but if we can get there, that's the plan, man. We'll go for the big, uh, we'll go for the ton for sure. Lovely. And what is there an appetite for to boost it up to six rounds? Because once you start getting the more and more players, mm. you don't actually get a um a, like a definitive winner. But at the same time, it does make it a bigger weekend. Is there any yeah. chat on that, or is it being is, considered? Mm, it's been chatted about. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's the first step. One, uh, it's it's a funny breaking point, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, the six player game, the six games. Uh, for starters, it means a lot of people that have travelled have to stay an additional night, um, mm-hmm. or and you know risk driving home after a full day of Walmart at eight o'clock at night kind of thing. Yep. Um, so that makes it really hard for some people to do regularly. So if there's already one or two events on the calendar that do that, mm-hmm. not so easy. Also had a lot of lot of players locally, at least you know in or direct friend circles I was talking to over the weekend, um, saying the two-day events in general are hard for them. Uh, their dads now, um, they work Monday, Friday. So to give up that weekend away from the family, away from the kids, and then go straight back to work again is really hard for them. Um, so to jam in a sixth game on top of that, so basically that's it. That weekend is pretty much just that tournament. Um, there's not even a little bit of time on a Sunday afternoon to recoup for the week. Um, makes it a little hard for some people. So I do think there's a breaking point where you go too much, too big games, too many rounds, you start losing some people. Yeah, you might gain others, but you start losing some. So we're going to find that sweet spot, and we'll talk about it more as we get closer. Um, it's definitely it's definitely one that's up for debate at the moment, though. We've, we've – because we did five this year, but we're going to six next year. Mm. And the thing – I think – I don't think it's possible now, but like, if even if you, I've always I've already thought about it, I've never really brought it up. But like, even just do a top two player cut for round six, so yeah. everyone everyone else can go home, and you just let the two blokes that want to, yeah. um, while you pack up around them, they can just go at it. <laughs> well, I think that's what the, they do that in the states pretty regularly. Yeah, they do a whole another day generally because yeah. so many. So they actually, so which is weirder again, because a lot of theirs start on the Friday, mm. so. They'll um they'll do Friday Saturday like and that and then you can fit like I don't know five hundred people and then they do like a top eight cut. I almost uh, feel like a Friday is better too. Um, it's starting think, on Friday, doing a Saturday, and then heads having, up. yeah, that's it. I think it's just a lot easier for people to take a Friday off than a, than say a yeah. Monday. Um, but yeah, I love that idea, and that's maybe what we what we'll do as well. Um. So you know, it's the vast majority of people, and again, the people that are just there for the for the event, they're not sort of dragging it on. They're able to go home and see their families and and drive home safely. But um, those that are really there for the fucking meat and potatoes, they they got to do the round six. 
Yeah. Well, that's it. Um, it's just like, so everything's under consideration and you boys are just going to do what's right for the community. And then, mm. okay. and that's, and that's what it is. And it's off feedback and off feedback I've heard so far, even the five days is tough for a lot of players. So the five games, sorry. So I say we're probably more inclined to stick with five, um, even at the hundred player mark. And, um, yeah, uh, we'll work out maybe something around that and scoring and how it works. But, yeah, see so how we go. Just score a lot of points. That's all you got to do, boys. Yeah, Just man. Get, get in the, with the hundreds. Play, play Necrons. Uh, yeah. it, it won't be Necrons <laughs> then, but whatever the, the version of Necrons is. There'll score. be Space Marines again by then, surely. Yeah. Oh, don't break the game again, GW. Don't. <laughs> of course um, they're going to. It's g uh, So... Oh, I think I think I ended up asking both my questions in that little section. Nice. So, um, lovely. Um, I, in saying that, with the terrain side of things, um, at some point we want to buy a trailer mm. that we can just start. Like you just put thirty tables in the trailer and then just you mm. can go wherever it needs to go. But that's that's on the to do list of that. Put. Yeah, we've done. We got my poor old X trail. Uh, the only reason I ever bought it was because it fit heaps of shit in there with the kids oh. I've got. But um, the amount of times we drove back to, to Cancon and back with that, the seats down in that absolutely jammed, like Tetris jammed with terrain, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, driving four hours around the state for events. Mm. Uh, but, yeah, trailers trailers a good idea. If you guys ever do do that, let us know. We'll, um, we'll hit well, you up. <laughs> we're um, – we're... Um, I think can uh, not can uh, Crewcon's going to um, rent a bunch of stuff off us for their mm. their two day, but like that's a lot closer than Orange. But uh, it's just like mm. there there is that much good terrain in this state right now between mm. you guys, the hall that McMillan's got in Sydney, us Hayden and um, the Gong Boys. Mm. You could you could put three hundred players on there. It's just you can't get it all in one spot. Yeah, and this is. Where we get um, so Chris Cross, Chris O, uh, Chris Yates, and um, Chris O Moore that used that used to run the um, Australian Championship before the Adelaide guys picked it up. Um, they used to have to do that. They used to. I think we got up to two hundred players at those events. Mm. Um, but we would go down with a convoy um, of cars, just shockers with all FNG terrain and and personal terrain, um, to try and bring that up to 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 a good, you know, better standard. Um, I th- but what you're saying there about renting terrain is not a bad idea either. Like, um, but Hayden, even this time around, I, you know, we worked out something with him. We'll fix him up for fuel and stuff because he helped us out so much with terrain. Um, so I, and I think that's totally fair. Like, get, you know, hit, hit some dudes up, put a little bit of that prize money to, to hooking up the guys to rent, you know, a, a trailer or something and get, get the terrain down there. Mm-hmm. I think, yeah. um, if you if you know what it is up front, you just you can just build it into the ticket price. Yeah, hundred percent. It, it's a lot nicer as a bloke that's um, built and painted oh, fifty tables in the past year. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. um it's a, it would be a lot nicer. I'd rent I'd rent those fifty tables every day of the week. <laughs> well, that's the thing because I, I just I did um, about twenty three of the tables for Battle in the Push. So I feel your pain. Um, problem is. They then sit in storage for about three months now <laughs> before our oh. next event. So it's almost like, yeah, it's awesome for that big event, but now it's wasted. So that's taken over Ben's garage. He he was Mate. having hissy fits. I got half. I got a bunch of tables in Sydney now, a bunch of tables on the Central Coast, and he's still got like another twenty tables just clogging up his garage. Mate, you're, he's not the only Ben having a hissy fit about his garage <laughs> being filled with fucking terrain. I tell you what. <laughs> My wife's about to divorce me over it. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Righto, I mean. mate. I think I'm going to have to wrap us up, mate. We have mm. been absolutely killing it. Um, no, I'll, make sure I'll, I'll make sure I put a little time stamp for when the, the, the competitive boys come on because – I promised everyone a 10, 15-minute intro, and uh, <laughs> we've, we've blasted that one out of the water. So um, thanks for coming on. Oh, yeah, thanks for having us, mate. Really Jeez. appreciate it. Uh, congratulations on the great event. Like Jeez. I said, I was following along. Love the venue, the terrain, beautiful. Um, thanks, mate. And I, I literally I was, I was watching the live as Ben was walking around, and all the little nooks and crannies, everyone had their stuff hiding in the elves. I was like, shit, that's like that looks like some good stuff to play on. Because like yeah. 
that's the type of stuff that gets my dick hard. So yeah, um, yeah, for sure. No, nah, look, stuff. everyone seemed to love it, and thanks to everyone that helped out on the weekend. I already thank you um, at the event, but yeah, wouldn't have been able to do it without them. So it's a community effort, and much appreciated. So um, yeah, thanks for coming on. Thanks, man. Um, we'll lead it into the boys, and uh, oh, before I let you go, um, yeah. Apart from the helpers, any more shout outs, or what can we look out for from you guys next? If you guys, what, what's the next big thing on the horizon? I think personally, for me, I'm looking forward to the D40K in Madawi next April. Yeah, uh, yeah so we're going you're Tickets getting on, on sale in often, a few mate. days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're um, nearly good as plug and stuff as I am on Sunday. Mate. But it's on Saturday for anyone that um, is on our Patreon, early ticket access. Oh, get on okay. that. Get on that. <laughs> um, but, no, for us, we've probably got uh, a little bit of a break now. Um, there's a few local RTTs with the store and stuff, but we do generally do, a, like I said, a, dis, a December to Dismember, which is a GT sort of level thing. Uh, but they're good fun right around the Christmas period. Everyone gets on the source and has a good time. So um, that's probably the next big one. And then we'll probably have a no respite um, earlier in the year, a bit after Adelaide. So look out for that next season. Beautiful. All right. Well, uh, we'll leave it there and we will now scoot over to Ben Way and he has first and second place from the event on. So uh, have fun with the big cat. Uru. Cheers, man. Ah. Bye. Buy, buy some dice. They're, they're pretty good. They roll lots of sixes. D6 dice. Hey, you. E- e- Etsy. It's on It's on the Etsy store. Yeah. Just buy the dice and um, c- c- click on the Use link. Use the code. Yep. DU40KL for 10% off. Okay, so welcome Michael, Duke, the Duke, and Rowan from ACT. How are you, boys? Yeah, good, Ben. Thanks for having us. All right, you, Duke. You don't sit in silent in the background for me, mate. All right. <laughs> So we brought you on today. You're doing all right, mate. You're doing all right, are you? Yeah. You're coming to us. We might have a bit of lag from you this this episode. You're you're in New Zealand at the moment, aren't you? You literally just got yeah, there. yeah. You ma- just managed to find some find some time to squeeze squeeze a, a little phone call in with me. So that's very nice. I appreciate that. So lads, we are all we are all here today um, after the weekend. I hope we've all recovered. We played Battle in the Bush on the weekend. I was there. You two boys were there. I think half of New South Wales was there. It was awesome. Um, we are here to talk about your games, and you two were the, the two undefeated players um, of the event. So congratulations to you both. Yeah, thanks, man. Really fun weekend, really hard weekend. I think, yeah, like you said, only just getting over it now, but uh, hard to get back into the routine of being at work. But, uh, yeah, it's a good weekend. Well, I didn't have to get back into the routine of work because immediately jet off to New Zealand. Yes, Duke was going off the wind into off off the wind straight into New Zealand. So what a, what a baller! <laughs> so um, look, just before we get stuck in, boys, um, I just need to plug our Patreon, of course. So if you like, love to support us and love love what we do, love some bang average content, where you have our Patreon. Um, the link will be in the description, um, maybe if I remember to do it. Um, and it's five dollars a month, just seen as an online tip jar. We appreciate your support; it just helps us pay all our podcast fees and stuff like that. Um, also, don't forget to join our Discord down under forty k um, online community. There's like plenty of people, not just from New South Wales, across Australia, even some guys from overseas. Um, obviously, like us on Facebook and all that jazz. And don't forget, if you are going to buy anything online, you can, for 40K and all those kind of assorted goodies, you can go on to um, www.emperor.cc, I think it is. Um, they're our sponsors. They've been coming on um, board and helping us out with the circuit prizes. Um, so if you go on to buy something there, it has to be over $100. You can put DU40K code in there and get $5 off your first purchase. All right. So not too bad. Now we've got some little formalities out the way. Um, I'm gonna we're gonna jet off and talk to these boys about their games over the weekend in quite an odd meta in New South Wales. Um, there was a lot of marine players. Um, what I mean by odd is I think it was probably one of the most evenly distributed amongst faction events I've, I've probably been to this year. Would you agree, boys? 
Yeah, it was a pretty interesting one. You know, as you said, a lot of Marines, a lot of Tyranids as well, a lot of Orcs, a lot of Chaos, a lot of Knights, not much Tau. <laughs> that was, was like different. one Tau player, I think. Yeah. And all that. I think there was like two Drakari players or one Drakari player, which is yeah. kind of bonkers as well, right? So. And one GSC player. So other than that, most of them were yeah pretty evenly distributed. So yeah, well, I think which I think is actually quite a treat. But I think like um, we're going to be focusing a little bit on Tyranids today. Um, all three of us being Tyranid players ourselves. So um, you know, I think it's going to be a really cool um discussion about how your games went. Um with two very different lists of Tyranids. Um, and, kind, and then we're going to end the, kind of the podcast after that, uh, what's well, the podcast, this segment after that, uh, with a little bit of a discussion about kind of where, like, us three feel Tyranids are and if we're on the cusp of um, staying strong or in the cusp of getting nerfed to the ground still. So, and kind of a few things like that. So why don't we talk about... Um, I'm going to go over straight over to Rowan, and we're going to have a chat with Rowan. So Rowan, Rowan came second in this event. Um, it's worth pointing out that Michael Duke did win the event. Um, they were both on 5 nil, and I think there wasn't even that many po- uh, battle points between the two the two players. Um, but, like, Rowan, you've been running, like, Tyranids for oh, pretty much ever since I've, I've known you, which was just before um, ATC. Um, and you've been playing, obviously, you've been playing Crusher and stuff, and you did really well. I remember um, you played Exterminatus, um, um, earlier last year and you won that and you've done some you've done some really cool things um i just wanted to say when when you kind of obviously signed up for battle in the bush and kind of all these changes and stuff happened and um stuff wh- when you went to write your list to for battle in the bush um what have you been running and kind of what changes and kind of concepts were you thinking about for this event like what's what's been what's been staying true for you over the last couple of months yeah, for sure. So it's been a bit of an interesting one coming from ATC pre-nerf Tyranids where everything was sort of still pretty new ground. Everyone was just kind of throwing as many Hive Tyrants as they could at the problem. Um, I'd, I'd been running Hive Flick Kraken for the last probably th- three months, just loving the speed. I really found it hard to use any other Hive Fleet. I got addicted to that eight-inch advance, the plus one AP, especially with Chaos Marines coming out. It just was a nice little can opener. Then I started to realize that I didn't actually need that AP. Tyranids were already a really strong matchup into Marines. Um, and, I, and, and I remember reading one day thinking, I had, what do I need to make a Turvagon work? And I thought, well, the utility is good, but I'd like to actually run it into something big like a knight and actually, you know, do a bit of work. I thought, okay, well, more claws of fire axe, extra attack, reroll wounds, heightened senses, reroll all hits, fight first. And now you've got a really hard hitting unit. And I thought, well, if I'm taking that, I've got to take some gaunts, some termagants. So I chucked some of them in, started, you know, a couple of the units of warriors. This is all still in high fleet crack. And then I realized, look, if I'm bringing all those units, Leviathan's really the way to go. And then I kind of just had those key building blocks, you know, a, a Reaper Hive Tyrant, a Turvagon with some Gaunts, Big Brick of Warriors, the usual elite slots you see, you know, Zoanthropes, Venomthropes, Tyrant Guard. I love Death Leaper. Um, I found myself all of a sudden starting every game with no command points. It's always a bit of fun, always a yeah. bit of a challenge. Um, the big missing piece really was some ranged anti-tank, and I'm a big fan of Carnifexes too, not just for their damage output, but they're just really solid units, really tough tanky units um so a couple of them and, and that kind of just filled out all the points put in a couple of biovores because uh, as as the three of us all know um there's probably not a better unit for disrupting an opponent that wants to cover the board um so like there were a few iterations of the list and then when i i hadn't actually run uh, the, the one i took to battle in the bush this time i hadn't had a chance to run it yet other than a few pickup games um but it had just sort of everything kind of clicked once I pulled those units together and uh, it performed really well on the weekend. I was really happy and I think I'll be making a few minor changes moving forward. But uh, for the most part, I'm I'm pretty locked in for the foreseeable future with this list, I think. Yeah, that's fantastic to hear. So maybe I'll just I'll ask you a couple of questions about what um what kind of put you on the road to that. So like the Turvagon is something I've played with before. Um, but I think like after Simon um, from Team Australia has been taking it out onto the world stage a little bit and having a bit of a play with it, I think like a few of the local boys have got um, in- inspired a bit. Yeah. Would you say that you that that kind of like got niggled in your head a little bit when you when you started chucking it into Battle Scribe the first time? I saw um, yeah it in the Australian team and and I I mean. Look, that list is doing things I don't think many Tyranid players can do. And it's a team's event, obviously, so they're you know trying to 
build their lists in different ways. But I saw the Turvagon. I was like, oh, cool. He's taking a Turvagon too. And I saw the Warlord trait and Relic. And I'm like, oh, no, he's doing something that's beyond me. I can't I can't do what he's doing. But um, there's just so much utility in them. You know, they're, they're quite an expensive unit. But you think about all of the th- uh, free points you make throughout the game just by spawning these obsec units or, you know, I mean, the, the free free 10-man isn't obsec, obviously, but you just get so much utility, um, so much board control by using it yeah. and the gaunts. Um, and if your opponent doesn't kill the whole unit, guess what? A whole lot are coming back and, and they're going to be right back in your face. Um, so I've just found, while I like making the Turvagon a bit of a killing unit too with the Warlord Trait and Relic, it's 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 the combination of the Gaunts and the Turvagon that is just so powerful and was really impactful in every single game I played over the weekend. Yeah, that's fantastic to hear. Um, it's definitely, it's definitely you know be, been, it's got some jank to it. It's got some a couple of different layers that people haven't seen from Tyranids yet because everyone's used to seeing those medium sized bugs, right? So yeah. it's like just adds these little gribblies and stuff like that into there. So that's really good. I've also noticed that you've been a Carnifex fan for a long time too, like ever since the book came out, right? Because I haven't seen the list that you run without Carnifexes, I don't think. Yeah, look, they're um, they're interesting. I mean, they they got hit by that little point increase, which hurt me a little bit back before the uh, Nephilim book when you could have one. I mean, I used to really kick them out, you know, um, Enhanced yeah. Senses, Venom Cannon. I give them the light cover, um, Carapace Buff, and sometimes even Adrenal Glands. It's in Kraken, being able to, you know, send one of them, send 17 inches and then make some charging at AP4. Oof, it was pretty yeah, good. Was um, yeah. yeah, but I think for this list, I didn't need that. I didn't need a fast-moving combat unit. I've got enough of that. Um, I just needed something that could put out some pretty decent shooting um, whilst being pretty challenging to take down in return. That, you know, seven uh, T7, two-up save, neg one damage, takes a fair bit to chew through that. Yeah, it's a bit awkward, isn't it? And, and yeah. something which is quite uh, different for Tyranids is to have that minus one damage and uh, stuff like that with, without CP, you know, innately and stuff like that. So it's pretty interesting. So, so um, Taco, going to go over to you. So, oh, Taco, Michael, I want to call you the Duke or Taco. One of the two. That's your nickname, obviously, Duke. So I'll, I'll just prefix so yep. people actually know I'm talking to you, right? So, so you just, so I don't know what happened to you, um, you know. But, when you first started thinking this, this, because you obviously just looked at it and just went, I'm just going to go pure violence today, you know? So, um, like I opened your list. So I, I played you at battle Royale and you were running a list, which was slightly, slightly similar, like almost like the precursor to this. Right. So, mm-hmm. um, you kind of like, you had your double, your double kind of and your harpies and stuff still. Why don't you tell us a little bit about kind of like when you played battle of the bush, what made you kind of continue down this road that you're going on? So why don't you tell us a little bit about the list first, and then and then we can then you can tell us about kind of what took you there. Okay, so the the list has uh, the double exocrine, one with the the voracious ammunition for the mortal wounds, double harpy with the strangle thorns instead of the heavy venom cannons, uh, the walkerin with the shard gullet, and then the flyerin of course with reaper. Was it two units of gargoyles, a unit of turn termigans? Three warriors and oh, what else was in it? Oh yeah, unit of biovores. Uh, two of them only. Couldn't afford the third. Uh, three tyrant guard and three zoanthropes, and that was yeah, that was the entire list. So it was just uh, really like big bugs and big guns, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh huh. Hundred percent. So tell us, so, tell us a little bit, kind of like what, because you played this something similar to a battle royale, right? Yeah. Yeah. I did. Uh, so at Battle Royale, I've played, um, was it, what was different was I was playing the Pyropod, uh, yeah. which in our game, we both played the Pyropod, and I was also <laughs> playing Kronos back then. <laughs> so I was playing, yeah, six Pyrobores that all go into the, the Tyrannus side that drop down. So I was thinking with Kronos and with Armor Contempt being a thing, with, like, you know, Sisters being popular, uh, I thought the Pyrobores can actually do quite a lot of damage to them. The Flamers, it doesn't makes them not want to charge in and Kronos with the extra AP in half range. So that's kind of where I went with that list, and I felt the Tyranids had to be very aggressive. Now with, uh, you know, the secondaries being changed, you know, Stranglehold being gone. So I, I tried to just bring big guns and harpies and stuff like that because the harpies with the Stranglethorns, since they're nowhere near as expensive as heavy venom cannons now, they got more shots, which are perfect for picking up stuff like Sisters. And they do, of course, you know, they do mortal wounds when they fly over stuff. So that's why I started down that road. 
with the uh, you know with all the big stuff instead of going more board control with warriors and stuff like that. Yes. Yeah, but then was... after, yeah, sorry. Um, after battle royale, I thought mm, the extra AP only really helped the harpies and I guess the paravors, but I wasn't super happy with the drop pod. So I cut them, and then I was like, oh, is it really worth still being Chronos? That's why I swapped over to Leviathan. Yeah, nice. Because we, I think we actually both dropped um, the Pyropod after that tournament because I literally just went back in the box as I got home and it hasn't been out since. Um, so, yeah, I, t- I totally understand kind of why you made that change. So, obviously, that gives you a pretty, pretty big alpha strike potential, right, with that kind of that kind of firepower and the obviously double harpy. Yeah. yeah, the double harpy was a big problem for a lot of people. Well, they just live in your your opponent's deployment until they get shot, right? Like that's just that's just how they exist, isn't it? Yep. So it's like, how quickly can you take down the harpies? Because if you can't take them down quick enough, that they're going to be horrible to you, very nasty. Mm-hmm. So, how did you feel yeah. like with your list going into into when you saw all the lists, Duke? Um, they they uh, got night. I don't know it was only the night before, or, um, the day, a couple of days before. Um, how did you feel about your list matching up into what you could see when you looked at like kind of the overall spread? I was, I was feeling pretty good about it because I felt like that the strangle thorns and stuff like that. And like most of my stuff was like pretty well rounded. Like you know, the Exocrine's cannon can it's got enough shots to take out you know um, elite units or vehicles or you know I guess semi hall. The strangle thorns being high enough strength could sort of plink some damage off vehicles, but being blast and stuff like that, if I ran into something like orcs, which I did, it'd be able to pick them up. So sure. I, I thought I, I thought I had quite a number, you know, I, I thought most matchups would be pretty favorable. And since I added the flyer and back in, I thought that was one of the missing pieces I had uh, from Battle Royale. Because yeah, I like sure. no counter charge, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> hilarious. So what about you, Rowan? How did you feel when you saw the list? Yeah, there's um, uh, I guess there was a lot of pretty interesting lists there. Um, I haven't had, I guess, one of the big things I always think about being from Canberra is we've got a big uh, Imperial and Chaos Knight meta down here. Um, so I'm, I always make sure I've got a, a few guns up my sleeve. Um, um, so I always, that, that kind of influences my list building a bit. And, and, and at Orange, obviously, there was uh, quite a few Knight players. Um, I always tend to look straight at the, the other Tyranid list to see what I'd potentially be dealing with because you always tend to see more of them in the later later games of the tournament. Um, I mean, both of yours are something I, I thought about given that one, just the mortal output would be massive and the other, you know, do I have enough big guns in combat to take out that many Leviathan monsters? Um, so yeah, like it was always a bit scary looking at those other big, big lists that I know I'll eventually run into. Um, and I'm glad that my list ended up doing pretty well against some of the scary ones yeah well, that's right we did well mate so why don't we have a little like talk about the games coming up we're just gonna um we've got a we're gonna focus on a couple of games uh that you guys want to talk about uh, specifically um but like let's why don't we just go um we'll talk about them when we come through it let's start off with round one so rowan you had round one there you played necrons um obviously pretty big um bit of a big baddie in the scene at the moment i'm just getting a lot of chatter from across the world but you know i think this this um from you know coming as a tyranny player myself i think when you kind of come across the table from this you know you've just got to go full send on it right yeah that's it um and given i think a lot of people at this point in the uh, season i guess you could call it um know that necrons are big and scary and have played a lot of games into necrons um and i've been lucky enough to get some practice from some pretty experienced players here in canberra um so when i saw um what was on the, on the tail in front of me, I, I knew already pretty much what I was going to do. In addition, that mission that we played round one, Recover the Relics, where, you know, three objectives either side of the table, it's not great for Necrons. They really want to have as many objectives close to them as possible. Um, yeah. so I, I was already at a pretty strong advantage there. And like you said, full send, run at opponent, and um, there's probably not going to be much left after turns three or four. No. And um, Tyranids so- are lucky enough to have such a good answer for the problem of the Catan that for some armies they just really struggle to deal with, whereas Tyranids... Yeah. You don't even blink. No, it was just so many multiple phase damage, right? So yeah. you can kind of work them down. I found the same with the Baden when I when I played when I've played him previously in the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, I feel like it's never really been like. Obviously, when he he'll get in and mess something up if you can't dictate the terms, but you can. You, it doesn't really. You can take one turn and kill them. You know, it doesn't really yeah. take 
too long to kill him. So, um, what about you, Duke? You played Iron Hands first up, didn't you? Yeah, it was uh, lots of Centurions actually, um, which I was not expecting to see. It was uh, what, like two <laughs> units of Centurion devs and a bunch of land raiders, assault Centurions. Yeah, right. I, I was um, because he had the drop pod with multi melters. I was like slightly worried, you know, if he goes first because that's what Iron Hands do, Alpha Strike, but. Uh, without much obsec, and I just had such big guns as long as I screened him out. And because it's um, how far apart we start, I, I just could keep shooting him as he comes in. So I wasn't overly worried. Yeah, sure. So well, that was 87 to 39. So, um, yeah, it was definitely definitely a bit brutal of you. So um, I think you both were pretty pretty unkind to the player across from you in round one, boys. Jeez. Um, so, Rowan, um, this is one of the games you wanted to talk about and obviously quite a tight one and meeting meeting um, a great New South Wales player in Hayden Ford in, in round two, which is Custos. And I have to say something like I, I travelled down with Hayden and one thing that I noticed is, is I absolutely loved his list. And I played... Um, an RTT with him the week before. And the first thing I said to him when I saw him was, I love your list because it's so different for Custos. Um, but you want to tell us a little bit about this, Rowan? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, Hayden's another one of those players where as soon as lists get opened up, that's the first one I look at. Um, yeah. I always know um, it's going to be something different. Um, a, a list that a lot of people would try and run and probably have a great deal of trouble, but Hayden knows exactly what he's doing. Um, for those that don't know, he had uh, 24 um, Sagittarium Guard, um, two Achilles Dreadnoughts, uh, Trajan, uh, Vexilla with the uh, Dense Cover banner, and a um, Terminator Shield Captain with the Praetorian Plate. Really uh, interesting list. Um, and... I always tend to run into Hayden at round two. I think last battle in the bush, it was round two when he was running his 15 jet bikes. So um, this is you know, a bit of a recurring I event now. You actually, I think you actually ran into him at Exterminatus too, didn't you? Yeah, I did. That was round one, uh, beginning of the year. So we've got a bit round of a history one. of bouncing into each other. Yeah. Hilarious. Um, yeah, so really interesting game. Um, we uh, both essentially start of the game there was no way anyone whoever went first wasn't going to have a very eventful turn there wasn't much to be seen and um, I went first didn't really do much uh, and then he shot every single Sagittarium at one Carnifex and didn't kill it and I thought mm, I'm feeling pretty good about this now uh, a few dreadnoughts later and finished it off but I was still in a pretty strong position um, and I was lucky enough just to be able to use use the use the Turvagon use the Gaunts to just deny his primary for the first three turns and really just put him on the back foot um, whilst scoring where I could uh, he, he then over the final few turns just pushed a big blob of Sagittarium with Trajan in the middle through essentially my entire army um, I had I think a unit of three warriors left and two biovores at the end of the game um, so yeah well that, they went hard didn't they yeah they just they just have a lot of volume and reliability um, they put out enough you know high damage shots and low damage shots that it doesn't really matter what they're shooting into they're pretty efficient um, but there was just a couple of moments where I was able to, you know, he he, he sent his uh, Mr. Worldwide Terminator Captain in to yeah. try and flip an objective. But then in the subsequent command phase, I regrew a few gaunts just to flip it back. And instead of getting an eight, I get a 12. And then I denied him an eight later in the turn a couple of turns as well. Um, and I got to the point where I realized I was going to get tabled. Um, but I was confident I'd, I'd scored enough that it was going to be... Um, a win for me obviously quite a close one um <laughs> in my head when i was adding up the numbers i thought oh yeah i should i should have him by about you know 10 to 15 points and i only ended up being by about six because he just kept <laughs> picking me up towards the end um yeah, wow. but look Hay hayden's a great player to play against really skilled just a good guy as well um really a pillar of the community as i'm sure you all know um and I'm, it's always a pleasure to go into him uh yeah and, yeah, as, you, and, and as you look at the, the rankings of the event he scored more than anyone else, scored more points than me or Michael and uh, came third uh, with four wins and a loss. So uh, he's a he's a real titan. Yeah, he is, isn't he? He does well, old Hayden. Goes all right. So, um, yeah, there's definitely a different list. I think it's interesting the way you use the, term, the Turbogon. That's kind of like when I've used it in practice games. I've used it similarly to that um, for that reason. I think that, I, that trick, you know, that's I love that. The, the whole spawn and the gorns thing. I do like doing that with gargoyles too. I yeah. think we, all, we all know that trick. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we love that one. But, yeah, that's fantastic to hear. And the other sort of, I guess, thing that I used against him early on by going first was just good use of spore mines. It's the best thing with 
Tyranids going first is you can get a chance to use the biovores, put, put some mines somewhere that, you know, the, the mines aren't going to stop their game plan, but it's going to affect them. You know, I, I put the spawn mines where if he wanted to get to another objective, units were going to have to get high advance rolls if they wanted to score any primary. And he did, but that also put them in a position that was exposed for my next turn. So uh, spawn mines and biovores are just such a... Oh, such a good tool. I'm, I know you're both aware to just manipulate oh, your mate. opponent's game plan. I swear that they're one of the most low key broken things in that book, if I'm yeah. honest. And, <laughs> and uh, yeah, you know, like, and I'm surprised they haven't been touched by points or anything like that. But that's we'll leave that discussion to the end. But yeah. I could I could do a whole podcast or some Bibles. I love them that much. But um, so what about so you Duke? You played one of the Wednesday Night Boys, the the hallowed Wednesday night boys um, and, and who, and the best Marine player at the event, actually best in faction, which I think is pretty cool. That uh, was Ben Hader. He was actually staying with us um, and you played him with his salamanders. That was a uh, 96 to 67, mate. Yeah. Um, so he played very cagey with, um, you know, cause he was afraid that if he walks out anywhere because of like the, the, the lines of my exocrines and stuff had, and of course the harpies. If he steps out, like his units just died. So he he just tried to you know get points off Promethean Creed and stuff like that, and I couldn't quite get to the corner that you know the objective that he had chosen. But I was I was just picking up his army and just rolling them up. Yeah, it would have been gross. I can imagine. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, I did. <laughs> I did dice him a little bit. He shot an entire like full unit of eradicators with like full rerolls from Vulcan into a harpy with a four up invol and still didn't kill it. I, I think I no made way. like seven out of the eight invols. Yeah. That's disgusting. Oof. I bet he was salty about that. That's brilliant though. I like, do like to see it. Oh, poor Benny. <laughs> so, um, we'll talk about your, um, next one. Duke, you played a uh, mirror match, Leviathan Nids 80 and you won that one. Obviously, 82 to 52. How did that go, mate? Uh, so that one was it was it was, go, it was looking a bit rough for me for for a while there because um, especially because it's a tighter conviction, uh, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. Yes, it that's was, the one. Yeah. yeah, so hold two, hold three, um, and he had like more units that he could send at me just to obsec me off the points and stuff like that. Sure. He had the more aggressive, uh, you know, like the warriors at the nine man block, um, and because you have to hold two or hold three, what is it? Uh, out of the three objectives, I think the, the way the terrain was set up, like one of them was just like out in the open. Okay. Like one on each side. Um, <clears throat> I thought I was uh, going to do all right. Like I, I shot my exocrines and I picked up a, a Carnifex. Unfortunately, he had made the mistake. Uh, he didn't realize how the um, <clears throat> the imperative abilities work. He, he thought that um, it was synaptic link range, so that it had to be, you know, 12, 12 away and you'd get the invol. Ah, uh, okay. But he didn't realize it was six and he put his card effects, like, pretty far away from the warriors. Ah, uh, sure. And so, yeah, I was able to pick it up uh, with one exocrine. So I just shot it in, card effects was deleted. And uh, I got a lucky psychic phase. So I moved uh, some neurothrope, sorry, the neurothrope and three zoanthropes with both smites that killed the harpy. Wow, that was, you uh, did get that was on the plate. You well, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, thir- yeah, did thirteen mortal wounds <laughs> with two luck, The luck of the hive mind's just uh, shining down on you there, mate. On for that one, by the sounds of things. Oh yeah, hundred percent. So, yeah. So tied to conviction. I did forget to mention that. That was, it was worth mentioning that on our round three. Uh, Rowan, you travelled all the way to Orange in round three to play one of your mates and probably one of your regular sparring partners um imperial knights list yeah so you Cody, probably, have you already played this match up like 100 times or what yeah look it's funny while we do practice into each other a lot we seem to get recently most of our games happen at tournaments against each other which can't avoid each other um i think game one you know this this uh, first round this weekend i scored 100 he scored around 86 game two he scored 100 i scored around 86 so we knew it was coming um it's a real shame because I, I do love playing Cody, but I think we're, we're sick of knocking each other out of these things. Um, and I, again, I, I tend to get a lot of practice into Imperial Knights in Canberra, um, but Cody always puts the fear of God in me. Um, uh, I, I have to or, say, he's put up some pretty good results the last few events that I've seen, Matt, so he's yeah, done he, really well. He's rock solid, and I, 
he always reminds me that I, I really need to respect the Knights um, and not really give them an inch because they, they do a lot with that. Um, him going first <clears throat> on, a I, I guess, a, a boar that I couldn't hide my entire army on. Um, he killed out of, out of my, let's see, 12... Tyranid warriors. So he killed ten of them. Um, yeah, wow. And that's and that's that, that's an intimidating start to the game. You know, before is, you before, before you get the chance to even roll the dice. Um, and you know, Imperial Knights. He was making sure every turn he had enough CP to do calculator targeting on the uh, on the uh, Crusader, I believe it is, the double gun. Yeah, Quistorus cart. So just mortal wounds more than you can handle um but i was able to i guess keep a couple of units alive again the gaunt survived till the end of the game each turn uh reaper was able to go out and pick up a little knight and then one turn a big knight and uh, you know knights just struggle when they run out of those um bodies really um they do, don't they? especially if they take the um uh renew the oaths secondary during an action in the middle where if they don't have an you know, if they've only got a couple of big knights left and they don't want to be doing actions, they want to be shooting their guns, you, you've got a bit of an advantage there. That's um, right. I find that um, knights these days with the new book, and I think this this is both types, you know, um, they just score a lot of points. They just get that, like, you, they just will get up into the 80s easy, you know, and, like, if they're really starting to push you and the player knows what they're doing and they start getting the favour in the matchup, like, they're, they're pushing 100 for most games, you know. Like, they just... I don't know how, you know, the secondaries they've given them and the way they play the primary now and stuff like that has just made them really, they just rack up points. It's really, really good yeah. to see. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, yeah, Cody's one of the, probably the best Knights player I know. Um, and he, he punishes people that, yeah, like I said, give him uh, give him an inch. So I love playing Cody. I just, yeah, need, a, need, a, we need to try and stop it happening at tournaments. Yeah, well, you know, look, there's always next time, mate. Can't guarantee it. Poor old Cody. Um, I remember walking past that table and saying, you boys, look at you boys. Um, and his face, he looked at me. I could see the despair in his eyes. I could just see it being like, yep, yeah, every, every fucking time. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. That's exactly it. Yeah. So, um, well, anyway, look, Duke, we get to day two. Um, I can't remember the mission we played. It was Secure Missing Artifacts, wasn't it? So Yeah, yeah. The, 30, the, the one you moved the objective, yeah. Yeah, so you played against um, one of the one of the good players in New South Wales, Andrew Sherman, um, and the Shermanator himself. And he was he's got his orcs back out. He's broke them out. Of, yeah. you know, he, he's been playing a bit of Tyranids. He's been playing. A, um, I think he was even going to have a look at playing some Necrons at one point. But uh, now he's back on his orcs. And that was um, ninety six to seventy four. Now I played Sherman in the event as well. And I also um, this is the first. That was the first time I played orcs. The new the new star orcs they can rack up some points, can't they? Yeah, definitely. It was one of the things I was very afraid of of him just being able to get all these points without me being able to do anything about it. Yeah, because they can really pin you in, right? I can really pin you in your deployment and um, make you just deal with a lot of problems while they're just getting lots of points, right? Yeah. How did that play out? Um, play out on the on the table. So, um, because so we. Because you get to move the objectives, right? Um, I wanted to try and make sure he didn't do the, you know, get the good bits and just like um, move the one in his territory closer to his deployment zone, but just outside, because then he could keep doing get the good bits on it very easily. So I won the the, the deployment roll off, and I made sure that I was the attacker, so I could move that one first, and, and that did affect him. I moved it out into like the open, so it meant that all the objectives you could do it on, he had to like really come out, and you know whatever came out, I would just kill, so he wouldn't do it again. So yes, I think it, that already helped. Yeah, that's that's a really, that's that a really good play because it's quite uh, counterintuitive, really, where you kind of like I'd say maybe in 70, 60 to seventy percent of matchups you want to go defender, maybe mm. even more of that in some events, but um, you know like. That that secondary, they've really tuned that to be really good, haven't they? So, yeah. So I, I think me moving that, and then he still picked get the good bits, which I think was a mistake on his part. Um, and this was the one mission on like the one game I really felt I needed to go first. I needed to try and pick up as many of those kill rigs as possible. And I think yeah. it was actually the only game all weekend that I went first. <laughs> Well, very um, good, Ryan. I went second every single 
every single uh, game. So, <laughs> which yeah. has never happened to me before. So, oh, it happened to me at Battle Royale. I went second every game as well. So, did you? Well, that's, oh, that's hilarious. That's uh, so, nine out of the last ten tournament games I've gone. Second. Oh wow, that's crazy. So, so how did? Was there any pivotal moments in this where you kind of felt better about how it was going? Because, like, he he's obviously racked up 70, 74 points there against you. So he he had he was he was getting some work done. Um, I think it was, and so it was kind of like two things that happened in the same turn that was pretty, it was pretty big that let me turn the tide a bit. Um, because even though I killed some kill rigs turn one and stuff like that, he was able to pick up my fly run and he was just pushing uh, me off all the objectives, uh, killed like most of my obsec. So what happened was he, uh, my harpies managed to pick up a lot of his Gretchen and stuff like that. And they just flew around, bombed, strangled thorns. They, they did their thing. And I think he split his focus a bit too much. So he he sent one unit of boys and one of the bosses, I don't remember exactly which one, to try and pick up a unit of three warriors that had the, the five up involve, five up feel no pain, and a CP for the damage. Because he didn't commit enough there, he only killed one warrior, and the warriors were able to like pick up the obsec, and then next turn pick up the character. And yeah. um, he he thought the spore mines were forced to detonate, and I had uh, six spore mines just waiting there. He was trying to charge into some zoanthropes. He charged in with the unit. I refused to detonate it. He charged in with the kill rig. Nope. He charged in with the boys. I blow blew them all up and almost wiped out the entire unit. Yeah. Like, wow. Uh, eight mortal wounds to it and it was it was just it was just losing way too much stuff at that point yeah i mean they still die pretty quick don't they the orcs but they um at least they can get some work done before they before they get there now so yeah i think uh he later he finally tagged the exocrine with like 10 boys exocrine and two biovores between the two biovores and the exocrine it picked up almost half the no actually more than half of the boys units now and they're not even very good at fighting yeah, that's um, that's yeah, that just sounds like um, poor guy. <laughs> Imagine getting beaten up by Bivores. <laughs> I mean, the Leviathan reroll helps. Of it course. helps him be that little bit more consistent. Sure. Yeah, that's interesting. So, um, obviously, Rowan, you 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 continued your trend of playing like people either that you you travelled up with or players which are very good players. You played Josh McMillan um with his with his sisters in round four on the same mission um, to a really close win to 71 to 68. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, and, and like, much like Hayden and Cody, uh, Josh is just one of these guys I keep running into at these events. Um, and uh, yeah, definitely another one of these, one of the best players out there. Um, much like Michael's approach to dealing with um, Andrew Sherman's, uh, orcs and trying to stifle one of their secondaries. That was definitely m one of my plans to help deal with the sisters. I knew that if I could move an objective into their deployment, that would make them unable well, unable to pick that, sec that uh, objective for Defend the Shrine as well as affecting their pick of sacred grounds if possible, reducing that secondary on that objective to a one point instead of a five point. Um, so was really hoping to win that roll off, get the attacker. Unfortunately, I didn't make it. Um, so Josh was able to move that second that objective just a little bit closer to, to his deployment, but still in no man's land. Um, following deployment and um, the start of the turn, and Josh getting first turn, it, I, I started to accept I probably wasn't going to win the game. Um, he was in a very strong position with some stronger secondaries, and I was forced to take definitely some weaker ones. Um, Josh, Josh even saying halfway through his first turn that uh, he was going to be able to win the game without leaving his half of the table. Um, interestingly, he, he did then leave his half of the table and made a big push for my priority objective. Um, and then I did the same thing, pushing for his, because not only was that his priority objective, it was also his defender shrine. Um, and I guess across the course of the game, I mean, a lot of things died on that table. <laughs> like both 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 our, both our armies were very uh, killy killy armies. Lots of uh, lots of melee um, units in there, and things were dying left, right, and center. Um, luckily, a lot of my lighter shooting units, even the Gaunts and the uh, Tervagon, were able to, were pretty good into Repentia, Um Whereas the Warriors were pretty good into his Sacrosins, uh, and then obviously mortal wounds from Zoanthropes picking up whatever they needed to. Um, 
and then we only got through four battle rounds, unfortunately. But um, by the end of the fourth battle round, I'd, I'd cleared out a lot of his deployment zone. He only had one character left and then some sacrosants in the middle objective and then um, a rhino and a couple of zeph left, whereas I had a, probably a, a bit bit left, bit, bit more on the table. Uh, Hive Tyrant, Turvagon still standing and a few other units. Um, there were definitely a few clutch parts of the game. I think dice really did impact that game on both halves of the table. Um, my old trusty Death Leaper uh, um, was uh, charged by his Cannon S turn one, uh, took no damage. Uh, on the subsequent turn, uh, on my turn then, with Cannon S fighting back, I took, uh, I think, maybe two wounds, so four damage through. Um, and then uh, later on in the game, I got charged by nine Zeph, and four, I think four of them put all their attacks into Death Leaper, and I took only two wounds. Um, wow. Yeah, yeah. So De- Death Leaper, obviously with the Obsec 5 models, Warlord trait, uh, um, that him living at that point was a big turn. It gave me an extra four points on primary. It gave me another point on banner. And on the subsequent turn, it gave um, it Josh a, a four or maybe even a yeah a four on primary. Uh, meanwhile, I've got my Turvagon rampaging through his back lines and – I mean, a Turvagon going into five-man units of sisters, he doesn't really tend to leave anything alive. Um, so, no, yeah, I think... Beast, isn't she? Yeah, yeah, and another, and, and even, you know, a unit of five rets shooting uh, when she doesn't have her invuln, um, a couple of clutch six-up uh, six armor saves because she has a two-up armor save, and, and then Catalyst means she kind of shrugs off most of what gets shot at her as well. Um, so it was a really interesting game, uh, really kind of back and forth. Um Josh obviously had some really strong secondaries that just didn't quite get him enough points in the end. Maybe that was to do with the game not finishing, though I think had the game gone to another turn, I probably would have still uh, kept ahead. Um, but definitely the hardest game of the weekend. Uh, obviously, Josh is a really good player, and I honestly think his sister's list is probably one of the best lists in the game at the moment. Um, it's got such a good matchup into so many armies, in particular the other uh, really strong meta picks at the moment. Um, so yeah, great game, Josh, and uh, I'm sure I'll see you again round four at the next one. Yeah, well, so jo- yeah, Josh certainly doesn't know how to make a sisters list, that's for sure. So um, look, so we Duke, you played uh, round five into Colin Johnson, um, one of their one of the local players up there, great player, um, and you, he was playing his T sons with um, a crazy amount of characters, um, and yeah. 95 to 42 round five. So a bit of a blowout there. Um, but I think like your list um, with the amount of AP and just pure damage it does was would have just been the thing that just forced the issue through right on that game. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, he was trying to, you know, get his cover and stuff like that with the uh, rubrics, but with the exocrines, you know, ignoring the benefits of cover and stuff. And I got like really good, um, really good angles and stuff to shoot like there was a there was a building in the middle that i just you know touched the ruin and i could see down like three lanes almost yeah i was able to like kind of pick my targets that i wanted and i think he got a bit too too aggressive with his scarab occult terminators he charged a 10-man block and killed 10 termigans which i didn't care about it did take my objective so i couldn't banner it next turn but it was right next to like all my exocrines, the harpies, so I could fly over, and the flyer. It was, I didn't have to advance him, I just flew over, was able to charge in. And I I assumed that he was going to teleport the Terminators and he was going to be aggressive with them. So for that battle round, I'd picked uh, Exploding Sixes of Melee. And the, I, again, man, the dice were hot, man. I charged in with the flyer. CP for the D3 extra attacks on the Scarabs. Got the three. Um, you know, have exploding sixes, and I gave myself reroll wounds. Roll eight dice. Even through a neg one, I hit seven out of the eight. Four of them are sixes. Leviathan rerolled the last one. It hit. That's 12 hits total. All of them wound. He fails six of them, so six Scarab occults die. And then 12 mortal wounds on top. Picks up the last four perfectly. Oof. You monster. Yeah, um, that was I actually dirty. saw Colin later on that afternoon, and I was like, how did you go? And he's like, mate, that was brutal. He said, that tyrant. He said, it did like 12 mortal wounds to me. And I was like, walked away thinking, how did it do that many mortal wounds? And then now to hear your story, I'm like, oh, okay, that's what happened. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I was, look, I, I knew he was going to pick up a decent chunk of them, but I wasn't expecting him to murder the entire unit. I charged them with three warriors as well, with exploding sixes, of course, hoping that they would chip a couple down. 
but the flyer just killed them all. So I was like, well, well all right. Uh, I didn't have the CP to run away though. So I thought that with his next turn with a psychic, maybe he has like, you know, some targeted smites, he might be able to kill it, but his psychic phase did not go well. All right, well. Um, well, so I, I knew that turn two was when I needed to put up my, you know, the neurothrope uh, imperative, because I was like, that's when he's going to be in range to hit me with most of his psychic. So with that and shadowing the warp from the harpy and stuff like that, he failed a lot of his powers. And when they did get through with the file filner pain versus mortals, I was able to shrug a lot off. So yeah, sure. the Hive Tyrant was safe, and next turn he was able to pick up his damage-dealing characters. So definitely Flarent was uh, huge there. Flarent just uh, chatting his way through the T-Suns. <laughs> yeah. And then, so Ronan, uh, Rowan, sorry, uh, you, <laughs> you, at 94, 84, mate, you played um, Taylor, one of the Sid- one of the um, guys from the um, North Sydney who plays the leagues and stuff down there. So shout out to Taylor. Um, 94 to 84, this is a tight round five. Yeah, yeah, really fun game. And, and Taylor, geez, what a, what a good guy. Just a really nice guy, really fun guy to talk to, play with. Um, and my first mirror match of the weekend, I was expecting you know, at least one or two. Um, and yeah, really enjoyable game. We, we actually picked identical secondaries. Um, so it was even more of a mirror match. Um, and it was just another game where I was able to control the primary early um, with the Gaunts. Um, I ended up literally just having, you know, a, a Turvagon sat in the middle objective with a handful of Gaunts living through every turn, regrowing, and just holding that. Um, there was very little left on the table by the end of the game. Um, I think just about – we both lost all of our troops. Um, and there's just a few characters bouncing around, and I think maybe out of Khan effects left. Um, highlights probably include – I'd, I'd lined up a few charges onto one of his Stone Crusher Khan effects, which, you know, utmost respect to Taylor for bringing a handful of those, because um, they can definitely put a bit of, put a hole in any kind of monster or vehicle they run into. So I was lining up a bit of, you know, shooting and, and combat and psychic to deal with one, and my Zoanthropes throw a smite and just deal nine mortal wounds and one shot it. I thought, oh, <laughs> okay, uh, back to the drawing board for my game plan is for this turn, I suppose, because that's the, I just I, I, um, speed run it. Um, but yeah, look, a really, really fun game. Uh, but it was another game that I was able to, I guess, look at the scoreboard, you know, around halfway through the game and and know that I, I probably had it in the bag unless something disastrous happened. Um, so I, I don't think I could have gotten a higher score with the secondaries I'd picked. Um, but it was, uh, yeah, just a, a really fun game against a really, really uh, good opponent. And I, I'm looking forward to running into uh, Taylor again at future tournaments. Well played, mate. Well played. So both of you, so... Just for the listeners' sake, we had Duke in first, Tyranitz, you in second, both undefeated, so kind of both first, if you know what I mean, just some battle points difference there um, with Tyranitz. And we had Hayden on Custodes. Um, what do we have in fourth place again? I think it might have been Josh with Sisters. Uh, yeah. Josh with Sisters, of course. Oh, he'll, he'll, he'll be so angry at me for getting, for, for getting that. <laughs> Um, and then, then, then I was there in fifth with Tyranids, and I Little think you know, you. Had, I'm pretty sure we had another Tyranids player in the top ten as well. Uh, yeah, I think Taylor, Taylor, Taylor finished Taylor, seventh or eighth, I think. Yeah, yeah. seventh. So, so like just bringing on to that kind of like what we're next going to talk about, like. So when Tyranid book first came out in New South Wales, there wasn't actually that many Tyranid players, um, but. Obviously, I've noticed in probably the last two GTs I've been to, been to, and even just RTTs, um, there have been a lot more Tyranid players coming out of the works. Now, obviously, um, just before Nuck, like Nuckman happened and stuff like that, they did a few nerfs, and then um, no, before sorry, before Nephilim happened, they did a couple of nerfs, and then um, Nephilim happened with the re- reduction of CP um, and stuff like that. Um, and people were kind of hoping that was going to be enough to kind of um, take Nibs down a peg. And it did feel like it did it for about two or three weeks, right? Like worldwide from like the media we're hearing and kind of 40K stats and stuff like that. You kind of thought like maybe Tyrannus have been taken down. But I think like it's safe to say that there's most people who were playing the book pretty in depth probably were more than ready to understand that it hadn't actually gone down a peg at all. Do you agree with that statement? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it's one of the deeper codexes out there. Um, and I mean, I think it's it's um, pushed a lot of experienced Tyranid players into 
a bit more of a variety of army construction. Um, anyone can, I mean, one of the more popular lists you see out there at the moment is just as many interior warriors as you can fit into a list. Sure. Um, that's a strong list. Don't get me wrong. Um, but there's, I think you could give that to most people and they'll do pretty well with it. Um, I think you're seeing some more different builds from more experienced players that uh, really show how deep the book goes. Um, Leviathan's obviously pretty strong, um, and I'll be interested to see what they do with it in the future. How do you feel, um, Duke, about it? Do, do you think that the book, like, so, like, I think it's safe to say that, like, one of the best units in the whole book is Tyranid Warriors, right? And I don't really feel like that is going to drop off anytime soon. Do you think that they're, they're going to be due another hit soon? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't think they they necessarily need to be, like, hit again, or at least not in the same way they did, you know, like, with the increase in the base cost. Yeah. Um, I think maybe making war gear, like, cost different instead of everything being free, because then you always have, like, the optimal loadout, and you're always going to pick the Bone Swords and the Death Spitter, and, 100%. you know, occasionally a Venom Cannon if you can afford it, because that's the only one that costs points. Yeah. Um. So I, I think maybe varying up the war gear cost would, would change a bit, because I feel like outside of Leviathan, they're definitely still good, 100%, don't get me wrong, but it's not it's not the same. I think most people, what they hate about them is that in Leviathan, they're all getting transhuman as well. Yeah, which makes them way more survivable, and and also in combination with Hive Nexus, because then if you got like you know the big block of uh, warriors as you guys were playing, then you can also put the invol on them turn after turn instead of just for one battle round. Indeed, I think yeah, I think without Leviathan, you wouldn't have as many many people calling for a hit to them as as there are now. So why don't we talk about a little bit about Leviathan in general, lads? Because we all ran Leviathan, so we all ran very different archetypes um, of Nids, but they were all centred around Leviathan. And I feel like I'm going to speak for myself here, and I, I want you guys to interject if you disagree or agree with me. But I think pretty much whenever I go to look at another high fleet, now I've played, I've snowflaked my way around the book, all right? I played Kronos, I played Jormungandr. Dr- we know that I did an Exterminatus where I didn't even take a Tyrant and stuff like that. And I've kind of just done silly stuff and whatever. But when you actually go to look into like after the nurse and stuff like that, I was like, right, I've got to tune this in a little bit. Like I, whenever I go to another high fleet, um, I th- I think to myself, I can deal without the transhuman. I can deal without this. I can deal without that. That's fine. But the one thing I I keeps me basically latched onto a Leviathan is literally Hive Nexus. Do you think that's a? Do you think that's like a bit of an overstatement, or what do you think? I mean, start with Rowan. It's a really good spell. I mean, it's just the utility and the flexibility because it's not just about. You know, you don't just always put the invul on the warriors. Like, you know, it's the default most of the time. But there are times where I'll have, I mean, I oh, I'll keep talking about my gaunts because I love them. But I'll have a unit of gaunts tied up. I'll fall back six inches. I'll cast fall back and charge on them. I'll charge a target. I'm charging something else that I'm going to kill. They've just moved in a big conga line halfway across the board to tag a few objectives. You know, I've had games where I've had tw- 30 gaunts tagging four objectives. Uh, they're just there's that utility you know and every turn you're like what am i going to do this turn you've got so many choices do i just want this core unit to hit a bit harder do i want to add a bit of survivability to something do i want to charge another target do i want to have this unit just be a bit more resistant against mortal wounds it's just so flexible and i do agree with um the statement about hive nexus being one of the most powerful parts of leviathan it, it is it's just it gives a, a durable reliable army just that extra level of flexibility and it's it's so strong what about you, Duke? How do you feel about Hive Nexus? Do you think that's like one of the linchpins of um, of Leviathan, or is that because I know that you're a fan of the rerolls and stuff like that? The give because I've noticed you've always taken that. Yep. Is there other other aspects of Leviathan, like hidden stuff that people people don't usually see from the surface? All right, so I, I think that Hive Nexus is a big reason to pick uh, Leviathan over most of the other Hive fleets. Like you know, some of the other Hive fleet pals are alright, but being able to, yeah, just essentially reuse some of your imperatives on at least one unit a turn is big. <laughs> Although, weirdly enough, I didn't actually use it that much uh, throughout the weekend. Most of the time, like, my core units, I didn't really need to put a, an extra buff on them. So I just went for more damage spells and stuff like that. But, um, 
Yeah, it's the, the Leviathan reroll. I think is is big because none of the other ones, like other high fleets, can get it. And just rerolling one hit roll every time you shoot or fight just makes a lot of your big guns and stuff like that a lot more um, a lot more consistent. Like every time I think of running the Tyrant effects with the Rupture Cannon, I'm like, I feel like I have to play Leviathan to run it, or you know, it's just gonna suck when you roll you know three three dice and two of them miss and. Yeah, that's right. I think there's like the the tables are interesting um, from what you can pick, and I've noticed you've been you've you've enjoyed using that and stuff like that. So, why don't we talk about like kind of where the meta sits a little bit, um, and kind of obviously where Tyranids sit in there. Obviously, they're top one of the top top armies. There's no point even you know even like covering that subject i think most people know especially if they've if you know if they've been hiding under a rock and they just listened to this podcast and seen you both uh go to five nil with them but like there's there are some bad matchups out there right um we all know it um why don't duke why don't you just head us off of like one of one of the matchups that you don't like for tyranids and kind of maybe why you don't like it a matchup i don't like or oh, it's tough i haven't I haven't really thought that one through too much. What about um, like tau, tau plasma spam? Oh, like yeah, that. actually, you got a point there. Especially because I run the harpies and all that. Yeah, tau is a problem with like the the hammerheads because sure. like you can't really hide the the harpies unless you like strategic reserve them. But it's um, so that means just railgun out of the sky or at least severely injured next one dead. And yeah, the plasmas are perfect for picking up warriors because you can only really do the minus one damage on one of them. So if you're playing a lot of warriors, they just you know just picking them all up, except yeah. for you know your one squad that you've chosen to protect. And five ups are five ups, right? You know, sometimes you'll make a lot of them, sometimes you don't make any. So you know, it's all mm. of a sudden you can have a have a, a unit of warriors just evaporate into dust, you know, from from that kind of thing. Mm. I find that um, with with the ta- the towel matchup and the hammerheads, the the transhuman comes into play quite a lot. Even when they want to reroll, kind of helps that helps that dice a lot on there. But I but I find that um, just just that they can their range and they can really kind of keep keep you back. I've always found on certain missions they're they're pretty hard to handle. Like I played um, Dawn of War. Um, against against and had a rough against Tau and had a rough kind of rough game against that. Not not over the weekend uh, a few weeks back. Um, I can find that can go either way. What about you, Rowan? Um, is there any matchups that you kind of like looked at, like that you kind of dread a little bit going against? Yeah, I mean uh, Tau's definitely one. Um, yeah. Like you said, Tau and Dawn of War is a real struggle. Um, inevitably, you need to cross that table and. Sometimes it's about putting yourself out there and seeing if they can deal with everything in one turn. Um, so tower is definitely hard. Um, I've actually had a bit of trouble recently to orcs. Orcs are a bit of an unknown quantity in Canberra. Um, and very recently, uh, one of the better um, players in Canberra, uh, it's got a bloke called Dale, has su- suddenly started rocking up with his goffs, and um, he's a he's a menace. He's been well. He did well, didn't he, over the weekend? He did. Yeah, he, he, he was in the top eight as well, I believe, and um, champion. And and I don't know what it is. I think uh, he he's very confident in Tyranids. The first time we played, he was quite cagey because he hadn't played into the new book yet. And ever since then, he's like, oh, I know exactly what I can do. Very composed player. And um, so yeah, I, I, uh, Orcs are a little scary. Maybe maybe this is a bit of a bit of PTSD though. Um, <laughs> and then the Tyranid mirror as well. Um, it's pff, flip of a coin. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. Hard to hard to know exactly what you're dealing with. Um, yeah, I agree. I especially, think like, especially if it's into Leviathan, because again, it can just it can really just come down to dice and oh, uh, how many how many fours it's get awful. rolled. Yeah, it's awful. Like uh, the the Leviathan matchup um, when you both when you both cop in each other's four ups, yeah. you know. So, but like, well, really interesting what you said on the back. I'd love to go on the back of what you said there and like maybe maybe kind of um, touch upon where where um, how different the two hundred lists are in general, right? So like. You're starting to see you're saying talking about the mirror and there's different archetypes. Um, kind of what there's a lot of like people spreading their wings with Tyranids and actually have something different. And there's a lot of stuff happening overseas as well, like some really random lists, people running Behemoth with loads of Tyrant Guard and stuff, which you know I'm, <laughs> I, I don't think I don't oh, think it's a great a great list in my opinion. Oh, it's not great, but I'll, I 
oh, I want to run it to see yeah, what it does. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. I mean, like, you know, you're taking as many hive tyrants as you can, right? But um, kind of where do you see your, yourself heading with list building? Like, you, you obviously, I can tell you've got a bit of Turbogon love going on there, um, and you're probably going to obviously be exploring that a little bit. Do you feel like you're kind of locked into Leviathan for a bit now? Like, maybe not in ch- by choice, but... Um... I think as long as um, I've got the Turbogon and the Gaunt in there, Leviathan is it's probably the only real choice. Um, I, I don't think I'll ever go into a, one of the other fleets that, you know, leans into swarms doing damage. That's just not the point of them. Um, I'd, I'd like to bounce back maybe into Kraken and run something a bit interesting, you know, with more Raveners and a couple of Tyrants and um, be a bit more sort of, play a bit more of a passive game that just sends out these really powerful um, killing units. Um, but, yeah, like I said, I think the Turvagon and the Termagants were one of my MVPs of the weekend, so I'm pretty pretty keen on the pair of them at the moment. Um, I'd like to also maybe bring in, a, a bit like what Duke's done, is just a couple of big monsters. I've got a soft spot for Tyrannofexes with Acid Sprays, um, just another incredibly tough tanky monster that... Um, puts out a really good bit of damage um i just need to find that balance between if i include the carn effects still or if i sub a couple of them out for something a bit media yeah there's definitely a lot of a lot of room for growth and stuff still in the book and i think um as the meta evolves a little bit more we'll be able to kind of explore a lot a lot about that yeah. what, about you? what about you duke like where are you at like because i've seen you run i've seen you run some, some real different lists over the over the time and some fun stuff like are you still are you kind of happy with where you're at or are you or are you still looking for a bit more of a change uh so i like the list that um you know i read at um at battle in the bush of course and i think for a while that's probably like you know what i'll take to an event but I would like to try some more like behemoth style lists. So I just I just feel like there's definitely something there, you know, um, with you know the infantry fighting on death and stuff like that. The plus one to wound spell, like, and uh, you know especially well, the, with the demons potentially, you know, what is it when they when they drop, they seem to have better saves in the shooting than melee. So you know, having a bit more of a melee focused list with behemoth. Um, I'd like to try something like that. I've been experimenting with Hormagorns and stuff like that for a while, so. Yeah, that's awesome. I think the, um, there's definitely something there in Behemoth. I agree. I, agree. I think that um, Obsec Monsters, that just sounds good, right? Mm. So, it's and just I Crusher, think, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Basically. Take me back. Take me back. Take me, yeah, yeah. I've never seen most Tyranid players say that, don't I? But this is really interesting about when you look at um, the page for Behemoth, they've got. Um, all of their stuff's pretty relevant, right? Like you, you can look at some of the other high fleets, like you touched upon earlier, Rowan with the Hydra, um, making them killy and stuff like that. On Gorgon, right? They kind of don't really like everything. Seems there's a lot of the page that feels irrelevant, right? Until you, till you hit Behemoth and you go, there's, there's something. You, you're almost, you're almost second best here, you know. But I'm just not sure because, kind of, Hive Nexus gets me drawn back to playing Leviathan, kind of most times, you know. Yeah, I've seen a lot of um, people going for the Monster Mash list leaned more towards Jormungandr and uh, obviously for the Obsec Monsters and sure. built-in dense cover. But when I think about if I was going to run a Monster Mash, obviously you want some Obsec in there, but I feel like you get a lot more out of Behemoth than, you know, play Behemoth, put some Venom Thropes in there, and I feel like you're already better than Jormungandr. Um, I just, yeah, I think Jormungandr's got a... Um, with the monsters, you've got to be over eighteen inches away, which yeah. feels counterintuitive to to using the monsters. Now, when I've run um Jorg before was when I ran the um double neuro in the um zones. Yeah. Which yeah. I've I've which is a bit of a fetish of mine, I'm not gonna lie to you. I love my zone throw, so I've been running them for years. And it was kind of when I first got into Tyranids, that's what I I use them as a detachment for my G Silla Cult back in eighth. Um so me being able to whack those, so I've got fifteen of them. Um so when I when me being able to whack those bad boys out again always makes me feel good. But Jorg felt great because my smaller units were getting that buff outside mm. of 12 inches, which suited that list really well. But I think Jorg actually um, needs a particular list concept to work. I don't think you can take a Behemoth style list or even, like I think you can take a Leviathan list, um, but put it in Behemoth and kind of make some tweaks and make it work. But I don't feel like you can do the same with Jorg. And I think um, that is probably what a lot of people are 
um, struggling with that high fleet because I actually I probably run Jorg, run Jorg more times than I've run any other high fleet in in um, the Tyranid book, which is probably more of a testament to me being a snowflake than anything else. But um, you know, like I think when I look at the other fleets, I think that um, you can kind of pick builds for them. But a Jorg gives you kind of like a little bit of um, it has a little bit of mystery around it. Like, what do I actually put in this? I think the only time where it really felt right was when I ran the um, the zones in it. Yeah, yeah, I think that's. Um, I remember seeing some uh, the Queensland Tyranid list at ATC was was your your with a bunch of um, yeah, a whole lot of Psyker, which yeah, scary. Yeah, well, that was Eric running that too. Which, yeah, of course. Um, obviously, obviously makes that you know twice as scary. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know. So, but um, yeah, I think there's some play. Like, so with the meta changing and un- unfolding like it is, you know, we've got like I feel it feels pretty balanced, right? Am I crazy or what? Like, it doesn't it doesn't feel like super balanced. I think like um, Tyranny's won like six events over the weekend. Mm. Um, and that's 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 something that well, I don't think is ideal. Um, and there's probably going to be some kind of hits. What well, do you do? You guys um, think they're going to do much to Tyranids in the in the data slate coming up? Like with the meta being so balanced, do you think that they need a they need a touching up? Um, I think there's something they'll have to do something. I think I think the last couple of months have been fairly balanced overall, but the last two weeks have seen Tyranids really yeah. step up ahead. Um, what they do. Well, I don't know if just points is the answer. I, like like Michael said, um, warriors being adjusted to a base cost plus war gear, great idea. Same with raveners. There's no reason why a double scything talon warrior should cost the same as one with bone swords and and a uh, death spitters. Um, yeah. So points, I'm sure there'll be something. I think a biovore is probably going to go up because everyone's starting to realise that they're uh, they're real nasty. Um, yeah. But some kind of change to Leviathan, uh, I wouldn't be surprised. What it is, I don't know. It'll be. Um, some people have suggested maybe only transhuman against range attacks, or only transhuman for monsters and mini transhuman for non-monsters. Uh, or if you pick Leviathan, you don't get a second trait. Um, don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows what they're going to do in the end? Um, yeah, I've I've heard some pretty good, some funny suggestions of what I think they should, what what, what people think they should do. Um, people think that you can only get the Reaper of Obliterax on a Tyranid Prime. Um, oh gosh. <laughs> people reckon that uh, you, your adaptive traits uh, are now uh, selectable for the game, but your opponent gets to choose one. Um, <laughs> oh, that is hilarious. That yeah. sounds like they're trolling, really. Yeah. To be and the last one is if your hive tyrant dies, your opponent then gets to sleep with your wife. Um, oh, obviously, right. obviously, it's not going to affect too many tyranny players. Uh, <laughs> 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 this is true. Touche. Touche. Yeah. So, like. W- Duke, Meta's feeling pretty good, pretty balanced. How do you feel about demons coming to shake this up? How do you feel that, um, I don't know if you've seen too many leaks at the moment. They're looking pretty spicy. I don't think they're looking like they're going to bust the Meta open, but I've heard some pretty pretty wild stories in, pra- in a couple of practice games people on some discords have had, which does get me a bit concerned. Um, like Bellacore just staying in combat and not dying against... Um, Abaddon and, and Ten Iron Warrior Terminators and stuff like that, just some gross stuff like that. So, have you looked much into it? I've I've only looked a tiny bit, like seen a couple of data sheets. I haven't uh, just very surface level stuff, unfortunately. Like I know that their save can't be modified or whatever, uh, which was interesting. After all these uh, things that ignore involves or like can remove oh, saves, mate, they just... bit of a mess, isn't it? Let's face it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. But um, no, nothing that I've seen so far screams out to me that they're broken. At least, yeah, so far. So, I don't know. I definitely think they'll be top contender, but I don't, I'm not too worried at playing Nids. I feel like Nids had the uh, the tools to answer them, uh, unless the data slate uh, changes that. Well, yeah, that's the thing. So, I, I don't really know personally what I feel that they will change in the data suite at all. Like I'm, I, oh, I wouldn't even know where to start. Like, to be honest, um, I feel like we're probably on the verge of getting a bit of a heavy handed one this time. Um, I think that they might, they seem to have got the, I, it felt like it was going to be enough last time, yeah, but I think the, that the old one was pretty heavy. Yeah. And, and I think that, I think like when Necrons and Sisters came out with these big balling secondaries, you know, um, and started 
really putting up some big scores. Um, it really just took the Tyranid players to kind of adjust game plans, right, and put some tech in there. And, and honestly, I think it was more strategy based for the Tyranid players. Um, and also, I think like a lot of people, a lot of people have Necron armies as well. So I think there's a lot of like probably not so skilled Necron players out there. Um, where I think a lot of the Tyranid players, I think there's also obviously there's obviously their fair share of um, not so skilled players. But I also think like a lot of the people. Um, who don't bandwagon have stuck with their two units, um, kind of like us at the moment, if you know what I mean. Um, I can already hear the screeches of people, me saying that. Um, but I, yeah, I feel like yeah. chaos demons are going to make are going to make a splash and they're going to mix some stuff up. But I don't necessarily think they've got a bad bad matchup into two units at all at the moment. I think it just it really it's just going to be another change of strategy. But I think like when was the last that, um balance slate out? I'm surely end of, end of June. So I think we are due one in the next uh brief three three or four weeks. Yeah, okay. See that's a that's a thing. So it'd be interesting to see what they do there. Look, I'm not gonna lie to you. I've I've been playing so my list uh, over the weekend was Shard Gullet on a Walker and uh Neurothrope, uh, two by nine warriors with all the trimmings, 10 gargoyles, three times three zoanthropes, uh, three venomthropes, three biovores, two sky slash swarms, and a parasite. And I think that's about it. So um, basically, I dropped after Battle Royale, I dropped the Pyropod, um, which was doing me well. And I was pretty, pretty, uh, pretty smitten to see that that duke he messaged me saying i stole your idea it wasn't my idea but like I, I definitely had used it for a couple of events before that um but i dropped that and literally went back to my zones and kind of made a hybridization of the list i ran exterminatus which was um four, uh, 12 zones um three times four um into the leviathan the Leviathan kind of archetype with the two big warrior blobs, which I'd, I'd really been enjoying. Um, I wouldn't, I've been looking at some ho- custom high fleets, um, talking to some other players about maybe what, what could be done there. Um, looked at going back to Jorg, and I think I'm probably going to like, what I'll probably do is maybe at an RTT or something in the next coming month, probably just test out the, the um, all Zoans list again, see how it fits. Um, I do enjoy throwing around it. I, I think I move them around pretty well on the table. Now the Zoans after using them so extensively, um, that was kind of my, my tech into the current meta was um, chaos coming out and chaos being a popular faction. Um, after battle Royale, I knew that, we were going to start seeing all the people who played chaos, but hadn't played it for a while and needed to hobby up all the new stuff was going to, we we're going to actually start getting some of that stuff to hobby up and on the table. That lag was coming to an end. Um, and I played one, I played this list when I first played it with the three, zo- three by three zones, I ran into a crash into bar list and I realized that, those mortal wounds actually allow me to deal with terminators quickly. Like it doesn't mean I'll stop them from getting in, but it means that I can deal with them quickly rather than make that fit that. Cause that, if that terminator units in your, in your lines or in combat or alive for longer than two turns, I think you've lost the game in some cases. Um, did you, do you think um, the influx of stuff in your metas have made, have made you kind of think that you need to start, tech putting certain tech into your list like obviously rowan you put the turbogon in your list but do you still think the reaper the reaper has to stay in there um at all just for uh, just armies like that yeah i think um as long as abaddon and Catan are running around or even just chaos in general and they can have that um they can have their disco lord who gets or any i think any character get phase capped with a specific slanesh relic um yeah as long as those things are bouncing around i don't I'd be hard pressed to leave Reaper at home. Um, like I said, Tyranids can deal with phase caps pretty well. Abaddon isn't just your average phase cap character. Um, you can't just shoot him. Um, you 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 really only sometimes get one shot at taking him down. So um, yeah, I know a lot of people hate hate the Reaper, but um, I think. He's not going anywhere, anywhere for a while unless they change his rules. But I think that'd be pretty strange. I don't think many uh, relics get their rules changed um, generally, unless there's something, unless there's a really bad offender. Yeah. Um, yeah so I, I don't know. I think for now he'll stay in. I'd, I'd love, I'd love to bring some of the other cool relics. I really would. But for competitive games, I, I just don't see me leaving home without him. 
that's what it feels like. What about you, Duke? Yeah, the, the Reaper has got to stay in. Like, I feel it's necessary with, the, you know, like Rowan said, with the bat and the Catan shards and stuff. It's as much as people hate it, got to, got to keep it in. Well, that's like, um, I, I, haven't take, I haven't used Reaper since, um, oh man, I haven't used Reaper since probably VTC, but that's probably why I'm keep on going 4-1, boys, and you're going 5-0. <laughs> so, you know, that's 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 pretty much my, my hot take there. So, well, look, boys, thanks heaps for coming on. Did you guys have any, any talking points or anything you wanted to chat about? Um, well, I think we've covered everything pretty well, you know. We've each got three different pretty interesting Leviathan lists. Um, and I think change will be good if something does happen in the balanced data slate. Uh, but like I said, Tyranid book's pretty deep. It's got a lot of awesome data sheets. Um, my only wish is if they do hit us with some more point nerfs, they look at some of those under, underused units and maybe revisit them. You know, gene stealers, too expensive, like 16 oh, points mate, model. Who's, yeah, who's doing anything with them? Hiveguard. I know Hiveguard need to be punished for their sins of the last edition. Um, but even, you know, 50 points for a, a, a shot cannon, Hiveguard is is, is insane. Um, yeah. A couple of things like Toxicreens, Haraspexes, you know, give them a little love tap and maybe we'll see a few more of them on the table. Um, so I'm just hoping that if there's balance to be had, it's an all-over balance, not just a, um, you know, a shot in the leg for those uh, really key units. That's right. Um, what about you, Duke? You got anything you, um, you want to bring up? No, Ron uh, basically said what I wanted to say, that um, they need to not just keep nerfing all the good units. They need to yeah. have an actual look at why people keep using those units because you know, some of their other options aren't as, uh, aren't as viable. Yes, I agree. Oh. So I think like when the book first came out, right, and everyone was sticking to kind of almost the same list, right? It, was, it wasn't it was far off. It was Warriors and, um, you know, Reaper. It was just the same. And you, you almost argue that some people are still running those styles of lists as well. Um, but, like, there was no reason not to take anything else, right? Like, that was the real problem, it felt like. And there's one thing yeah. that I'd actually like to, to talk about quickly, just real quick, right, is that I honestly think if they put Termagants down or even Horms and Terms down one point, I think we have opened up a whole other side of the book that we have not seen before. Because I think all it takes is one point on, on Termagants. Yeah. And I think you will start, oh, yeah, 100%. To people, start seeing people bring some real wacky stuff. And I think you'll see Tervagons. I think you'll even see double Tervagons. Yeah. I think you'll see 60 to 90 Gaunts. Um, probably more like the Kermis. Sorry? sorry? Uh, I'm ready for it. Like, you know, yeah. if they drop at one point, I've got my double Tervagon, got like a 120 Gaunts or something. Oh, yeah. yeah, mate, oh, I'm yeah. so ready. I'm so ready for that. Like, I, I've got I've got two Tervagons and countless amounts of Gaunts. I'm king. And I also... this, um current meta, like, I didn't run into many armies that could deal with 25 Gaunts all at once. Granted, you know, yeah. many transhumans sometimes in Invuln, but in this meta, someone rocking up with 120 Gaunts and a couple of Tervagons, boy, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think if you could run the clock well, if you can run the clock well, I, I can't see many people just just getting rid of those gaunts quick enough. Not not as not as quickly as as a, as two turbogons like just you know giving birth to more, which is which is crazy, you know. So I think there's there's heaps of stuff like it would be nice, like you said, Duke, if they uh, well you both said if they um, do touch up like the Reaper or even Leviathan in general, they give us there's a one point knock off with term with ter, uh, termagons because i think that that's that that's you'll start seeing people running some hydra and some gorgon maybe with that i mean it, that might be a bit of a push because i still think leviathan is just too good at the moment but they'd have to significantly change that to make that an option so that's great lads well look yeah. thanks seems for coming on it's been great having the hive mind on talking some tyranids it's a very self-indulgent episode for me today so it's a shame we have to end it but um <laughs> Did you go, boys want to do some um, shout outs for the for the weekend just gone or for your crew, your local crew? Yeah, for sure. Um, mainly the crew I went up to battle uh, with. Um, Nick Sutherland, like I said, his first GT he's ever been to. Um, and it was a pretty big one for his first one. He, he went 3-1-1, uh, came 13th overall, which is pretty awesome for a first GT. Um, yeah, what a boss. Yeah, I know. Really, really proud of him. I've been I've been teaching him how to play over the last like six months or so. So, you know, pretty proud of, of him. Um 
Locke uh, McDougall as well, who came up. He did really well with his Harlequins. And uh, and Cody as well, of course, who, um, again, I'm, I'm sorry, Cody. I'll I'll try not to pair into you next time, mate. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Duke? Oh, yeah, definitely all, you know, all the boys we, we stayed with, you know, like yourself, Ben, uh, Tim, actually the other Ben as well, Josh McMillan, uh, Feud. Um, I feel like I'm forgetting someone, but yeah, all, all the boys that were there, uh, you know, helping me out on the list, like with Josh and Feud, and uh, also trying to help me get through the weekend with, uh, you know, with my voice being as terrible as it was. Yeah, you I'm were on the weather know, there, weren't you? Oh, it was so bad. <laughs> I was um, lucky enough to stay. We had nine people in our house, so it was pretty hectic, but it was great, great laugh, wasn't it? So we had, uh, we had like Wednesday night boys brought their uh, Switch with Jackbox on it. We had the the boys playing some darts. Uh, it was all it was a bit of table tennis. We, we were living the dream. Mm-hmm. It was a shame we had to return. But, yeah, look, thanks to the Friday night boys for a great event. Um, we all enjoyed ourselves. Uh, they have... Their terrain was fantastic for the event. The venue was amazing. Yeah, um, like one of the better, just, one of the better venues I've been to. One of the, those events was, was great. wasn't it? It was fantastic. So, um, and you know, like it's always, it's always, it's always a treat going over to Orange because it's like every time I go to Orange, I forget how crazy big and hidden away that community is. Like it's just like in the middle of nowhere, there's this massive community that the boys from Friday Night Gaming and the boys from Brawl in Bathurst. Um, have all built over the years and it's just this like big anomaly like hot spot in the middle of nowhere right and there's just so many people like this was the 70 72 people i think after a couple of drops yeah yeah pretty incredible that's pretty incredible hey from the, you drive five hours you think you're in the middle of nowhere and then all of a sudden there's like there's you know 72 people and it, the thing sold out within a couple of days as well so you know absolutely bonkers so massive shout out to those boys like I said, thanks for thanks for tuning in, lads. Um, thanks for coming on and giving us your wisdom. Uh, congratulations to the both of you. Take care, lads. Yeah. Cheers, man. Remember, always keep your blade sharp, your bow strung, and you know, kind of keep your credit card details updated because otherwise Battlescribe goes off and then the whole world loses its goddamn mind from advice of the Khan.